Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. We will call this work session to order. We have a robust schedule today, so we're going to move it right along today. And I would like to thank everyone for being here. Uh, public comment, we have two individuals who have signed up, and two citizens who have signed up. The Board of Commissioners appreciate your participation in local government, and we welcome your comments this morning. I will ask that you be mindful of your three minutes and uh, your three minute limit. Therefore, when you hear the buzzer or the sound of the music, please wrap up your sentence. For the record, please state your name and address. And our first uh, citizen is Mr. Larry Pierce. Mr. Pierce, please come forward. Give us your address and your subject matter. Good morning, Madam Chair and fellow council members. Well, you all ought to buy me a stamp. I could save 10 seconds. All right. First week of October. Uh, give us your name and address, Mr. Pierce. Larry Pierce, 4120 Van Sant Road, Douglasville, Georgia, 30135. Oh, okay. Thank you. Madam Chair, I would please ask you, I need five minutes to help you save a ton of money. And if it's not worth it, I will not talk next week. <laughs> Thank you. About three minutes. Let's go without three minutes. I, I, I might get arrested then. All right. Last Wednesday, I was in the jail. Mm -hmm. But I was addressing eight people that cared to hear what I had to say. And you know what? <coughs> Sheriff let me do it. I said whatever I wanted to say to these guys. I hope I could turn their life around and do something. And I'm not even a minister. But let me tell you something. I'm also not a very religious person. So I'm practical, okay? I'm not agnostic. But in this definition of things in the Bible, the first passage in the book, it says, in the beginning, now, in the beginning here was March of last year. And in the beginning, the coroner lied to that lady right there, Miss Hallman. But it's not Miss Hallman's job to ask <coughs> questions. It's her job to trust, and that's what we're supposed to do, trust people who come to us. And she's here today. And man, I got excited when I found this out Thursday, I'm sure to tell you. When I found out, number 12, authorization to amend the budget of the corner. What for? For indigents. For indigents. I don't know if half of you know what an indigent is, but you find out real quick if you go to jail and don't have any money because you get a free attorney. Well, let me tell you something. <clears throat> an indigent is a person that has no relatives, that doesn't have any money, and is taken care of by all of y'all. $995 for cremation, okay? Now there's another thing that none of y'all know, and that is, <clears throat> you see, I'm a little investigator, and when I know nothing, I don't have nobody <clears throat> telling me which way to go. So I start asking questions. Thousand dollars here. In fifteen, it was thirty twenty-four thousand. So twenty-four people died. Indigent. Then sixteen thirty-two, seventeen thirty-four, and eighteen now Miss Holman just printed out. Thirty thousand. So at that rate it'll be about thirty-six thousand at the end of the year. Really not much of an increase. But she's here to try to convince you that Miss <coughs> Renee Godwin needs more money. Well, let me tell you something. Renee Godwin, do you see her? Uh -oh. Do you see Larry Bussey? No. It's time to quit this foolishness. Mr. Pierce. And if you people can't see it. Mr. Pierce. Yes, ma'am. Your three minutes have expired. Pardon? Your three minutes are up. Okay. Thank you. Well, I talked to the jail people for an hour and a half, and that's all I've talked to y'all in a year and a half. And you know, it ain't over till the fat lady sings. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pierce. Appreciate your participation in local government. 
Next we have Mr. John Tomaski. Mr. Tomaski, please come forward and give us your <coughs> address, please. Uh, Jim Hunt Tomaski, 2929 Coast Road. Good morning to all. Uh, I'm also uh, speaking somewhat on the subject uh, just addressed. Um, my focus is on little audits. Shut up. A little louder. Shut up. Madam Chair, direction. Point of order, please. Where's? Point of order begins here with the interruption. I asked it to be louder. <laughs> That's the chairman's job, not yours. You don't run the meeting. She does, ostensibly. Mr. Maskey, would okay. you please, would y'all please stop? Can we restart the time? Yes. Are you ready? We have stopped our time. Yes. Please proceed. In March of uh, 2017, the subject of the corona became a political football. <coughs> And uh, the football has been uh, kicked around by various parties. The administration at that time commissioned an audit, a spot audit, which found exceptions in two areas of the government for 2016. One is an area which uh, the Board of Commissioners is, uh, has always been rather disinclined <coughs> to involve itself with. The other area was the coroner's office, where in 2016 a couple of exceptions were found. The uh, leadership of this board had mentioned uh, <coughs> both to me and others, that it was their intention to have a full forensic audit of 2016 of the coroner's office to follow up on results that have been found. And if that spot audit had been done in good faith, that's what one would expect would happen. If it doesn't happen, it begins to raise the question, well, was that just a political football again, where they just trying to get out of the headlines until the issue dies down and really not address it. In order to find out whether the criticisms of the coroner have any basis in fact, and also to find out whether the exceptions by the previous coroner were simply flukes or aberrations or not, each of those individuals deserves the right to a full forensic audit, either to be exonerated <coughs> or for due process to proceed from that point. However, to my knowledge, since the spot audit, there has been no movement to a forensic audit. In June, we had three presentations on the coroner's office, one by the coroner, and one by each of two other individuals who are not terminally qualified <coughs> as auditors. So I am suggesting that this board reconsider <coughs> commissioning such an audit. For example, the Finance Committee has retained very competent financial people, Dr. Corbin and Dr. Arrington. <coughs> so I would welcome any member of the board making a motion to that effect. Mr. Tomaski. Thank you. Thank you so much. Again, we appreciate your participation in local government. We will take this matter under advisement. Um, next, uh, commissioners, we have the approval of the minutes. I ask that you take a look at those and be prepared to approve to approve tomorrow. We have proclamations. Tomorrow we have four pro proclamations that we look forward to the readings. And also, uh, at that point, the Board of Commissioners will uh, decide to approve or disapprove at that time. County Administrator, do you have any new business? <coughs> or no, my business today. Um, next, we have our business items. We have tab number eight, authorization to accept the ARC Senior and Disabled Transportation Voucher Grant, AG <coughs> 1917, for July 2018 through June 2019, and create a 
and fill part-time voucher clerk position that is 80% funded by the grant and amend the budget and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Watson, good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair and Board of Commissioners. We have received another year of funding for our uh, senior and disabled transportation voucher program. Uh, we're due to receive $87,184 in federal funds, which requires a $59,296 local match. Now, what this will enable us to do is to increase the clients in our program from 90 to 120. Uh, it will allow us to continue our full-time voucher uh, uh, mobility coordinator with the federal grant paying 80 percent of her salary and it also allows us to create a new part-time position 20 hours a week 12 dollars an hour uh, time <coughs> voucher clerk to handle a lot of the administration uh, of this particular program now the good thing is that this none of this will require uh, a budget amendment we have the uh, the funds are already programmed in the 2018 uh, budget in, for for our voucher program, and then of course for 2019 we submitted that uh, as as part of our our budget. So there won't be any impact uh, on the budget as it is. Okay. Any questions for the board commissioners, Commissioner Geiger? Yes, uh, Gary, how much does a hundred dollar <coughs> voucher cost? Ten dollars. Uh, that's to the people, but how much do, do we pay, or uh, the government pay? Fifty percent. We pay fifty percent of it. Well, we we actually would pay forty percent of it. The federal government pays fifty percent of it. The client pays forty <coughs> percent, and we would pay the other forty percent. So, have you done any kind of studies about um, how maybe in county? We could buy more vouchers for the seniors and the disabled people. No, ma'am, we really haven't looked into that. Uh, I thought when we talked one time that you, you gave me some figures about how much it would cost to say buy another hundred vouchers or something. Well, uh, yeah, I, I did uh, estimate that. That and what what we did on that was the question that I was asked is how much would it take to wipe out wipe out our waiting list. And my estimate on that was about another hundred thousand dollars. Another hundred thousand. Yes, ma'am. But we can't use grant money or of any sort to you, uh, to pay for additional no. vouchers. No, ma'am. Because that actually goes to people, uh, right. and they they can utilize it um, to go to the grocery store, the doctor, who pays wherever. Yes, ma'am. So, um, have you ever thought about having a sponsorship of? you know, corporate sponsorship of vouchers? Well, we, we've talked about that, and one of the drawbacks to that is that uh, we simply haven't had the, the time or the manpower to, to really go out and, and promote that aspect of the program. Now, if we get this part-time <coughs> voucher clerk, that will free up the mobility coordinator to do some of that, to go out in the community and see if we can create some sponsorships. So we can't go out and get uh, sponsors, I mean uh, grants from the local stores or doctors or Wellstar or whatever to apply to this. Yeah. Yes ma'am, that's what I'm saying. We could, we could try to do that, but to this point the administrative load on this is so so difficult that the person simply hasn't had the time to do that. Yeah. With the, with the part-time clerk to take some of those responsibilities away from her, she will have time to go out into the community and see if there's any possibility of sponsorships or, or, or grants from these various agencies. Okay, I, I look forward to us proceeding with that because I hate to think that the hundred people that's on the waiting <coughs> list has to wait for somebody to die or move away. Right, and totally to agree. To get that, uh, that list is pretty very slowly, I guess you'd say. So, um, once once somebody is on the list, they're, they, on, it for they're on it until sadly. <coughs> or they, they can no longer leave the house, or, I guess, or something like that. What, um, with, until their health gets so bad that they just simply can't get out, or, yes ma'am, or, or if they pass away. Or something, right. something like that. 
Yeah. All right. All right. I yield back. Thank you, Commissioner. Dyer. Commissioner Mulcair. Two questions. Um, the, I think the whole commission would love to see this waiting list erased mm -hmm. with people who do not have mobility. And I think we, we partially addressed that in the last budget, increased funding, if my memory serves me. But it's not enough. It hasn't been enough. So help me understand this $100,000 figure. Uh, what is the split? Is that uh, all, all partners involved, <coughs> or is that just the county share? You see what I'm saying? Well, with the way the program is, is structured now, the voucher sales would be 50% federal and 50% local. And again, the local is actually 40% county and 10% participants. Okay, so what I'm saying, we're talking about 40% uh, of $100,000? Correct. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Right. Okay. Secondly, is there is there any talk about uh, uh, grants and solicited money from the community, specifically <coughs> businesses and so forth, is there anything that would prohibit advertising no. on all these buses that we could sell advertising? No, absolutely not. Okay, that may be a solution. I yield back. Okay. Any other uh, commissioner? Robinson? Yes, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Just, just a couple questions. Welcome back, Gary. Hey, thank you. We've been on vacation, so we haven't caught up. Um, so I, I just want to, we, we didn't talk about this in our committee, so I want to, just, just for the record, um, so I want to bounce this up to the full board commission fully. Um, on this particular item, um, do you have an idea how big our senior population is? Because there's there's different degrees, right? I'm gonna keep this real simple. Um, you know, I, I just got my ARP, that you're almost eligible card. Uh, not quite there yet, but I got the little pre-card. Then you got the 55 to 65, 65 to 75, 75. 85 and then plus. What is, uh, and those are all different degrees of mobility. Uh, I used to be involved in assisted living communities when I was younger, so I understand aging in place and all those things. So let's just keep this simple. What's our average age, do you know, of the person who's currently participating in this program? Just, well, do you know? The, you have a range. Well, the, sen the seniors who participate in our program, uh, they've got to be 60 or over. We don't, we don't break it down as to 60, 65, 70, that way. So I have to truly see, okay, senior for general definition. All right, so we got 60, and so uh, we, how many seniors are in Douglas County? I should know this, Mike, sure. that ACCG had provided that book for us, but I don't have it right now. Well, uh, according to the census information, the number of adults in Douglas County is 101,085. Uh, the number of seniors, and again, that's age 60 and over, right. is 14,243, or 14% of the overall population. So 14,000 people, give or take. Um, and we're addressing how many, 100? Yes, sir. Relatively speaking. Again, everybody didn't have that need, per se. Right. right? So you've you got to keep it all in <coughs> perspective. Um, and we've got a waiting list right now of what? About 150. 150. And, and how often does it turn? Like, in, in, and I know you know it's not an absolute conversation, but like, how often do you see somebody come off the list, get off the list? Ah, what's the turn? It's typically, it, we might have one turnover, run rollover every two months, every three months. Turnover is very, very oh. small. Okay. All right. So, again, slow, but it's a service. It, it provides, you know, for those uh, that has less frequent of a need to move, um, it, it truly is probably around quality of life to a doctor, to wherever they got to go, to a single grocery store, but not a, a frequent mobility need. So it, it has its purpose. Um, is there, and maybe this is a question for the full board, and I'm sure I'm not really going to yield with this, is that is there something we can talk about during the budget process? Is, but can we add, as Board of Commissioners, to this? In other words, without the grant, I mean, I'm just, and I, I know this, but I, I'm going to ask it from, again, from my perspective. Could we? Yes, sir, you could. Now, the thing about that, though, is that this, this is the grant money that is available to us right now. Yes. If the Board of Commissioners wanted to add more money to it, it would basically be a 90% county Participation oh, with a 10% client match. Yeah. All right. Well, 
To that point, I'm just, I, I think we're all sensitive to the need of the <coughs> population that may be out there, uh, especially, especially because I know they've always said, well, Kelly, why don't you get on that? And I'm like, well, no, I'm not going to get ahead of anybody else. Not, I, I have other alternatives to move. Um, so it's a little bit different. But I'm sure like other people, I just chose not to get on it. The list could be way more bigger. Uh, we just, you know, in other words, I don't have time for two and a half years. I got to go right now. So it's, it's a different movement. So to that point, <coughs> um, it, it's a need. Um, I think um, Commissioner Mulker, we talked about it. We should not let this go um, to at least put an earmark or a pin mark um, in how do we address this. But let's talk some more about this. We'll probably bring it up in the committee in a couple of weeks. Madam Chair, uh, we just want to acknowledge it. We'll, we'll keep moving. That's it. Please. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Yes, Gary, I need some clarification because when I talked to you, I thought you said it would cost the county $100,000. Uh, Commissioner Mulcair just asked you what portion would be ours, and you said forty percent of the hundred thousand. That that's that's where we are now with with the grant. Now, if we if the board of commissioners chose to move forward, we right now we don't have any additional grant money that would be the match. So, if if we needed a hundred thousand dollars. To clear out our waiting list, there's no additional grants fund for that right now. It, that would strictly be a county participation, right. minus the 10%. But you said something about 90% uh, a second ago. <laughs> the, the participant pays 10, right? The county would pay 90 to make up the 100. Okay, so if we wanted to expand it for 100 people, it would cost us around $100,000 out of our budget. No grant money. Right. And no grant money is is available. Correct. Okay. Just need to clarify that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I knew that. Okay, thank you so much. And Rebecca Watson, thank you and welcome back to vacation as well. My um, Chapel Hill News and Views uh, columnist month was about seniors and all the amenities and all the uh, items that are available to them and certainly I would love to see the Transportation Committee embark upon looking at the corporate sponsorships to assist with the budget impact if we could. You say that's possibly something that could be done, but we want to do it rather, we want to do it now sooner than later. Sure. Because that waiting list has been out there for a while, late yes, years, right? Yes, we want to change the, the atmosphere for our seniors. So if we could look at that, and um, so we appreciate what the Transportation Committee is doing. I'm quite sure y'all have some positive news for us real soon. Okay. Thank you. So, any other questions for Director Watson? Thank you, Director Watson. We have tab number, oh, you, again. Still here. Tab number nine, authorization <laughs> to purchase eight additional 15 passenger cutaway vehicles for the fixed route bus service and amend the 2018 budget to include $446,000 of $446,400 in federal grant funds as recommended by the Transportation Committee. Director Watson. Yes, ma'am. As you know, we, we already have four of the 15 passenger cutaways uh, in our fleet. Uh, as we prepare to implement the fixed route bus service, we need eight additional uh, vehicles. Uh, this would serve the four routes, um, and it would allow us to uh, have enough vehicles for those four routes, a couple of vehicles for backups, and also a couple of vehicles uh, for the required uh, ADA paratransit service. Uh, now, and it, it would also allow us to keep the headway uh, at a reasonable uh, time. And I, what we're shooting for is 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Anything longer than that is, uh, we feel would be uh, detrimental to just trying to attract good ridership. But we have grant, <coughs> grant money available already, uh, already in place for $446,000. Uh, that requires a $111,600 match, and it's my understanding that that, that money uh, is already in the budget available to us. Mm -hmm. So what we're asking for you today is just to include that $446,000 in the 200, 2018 budget so we can go ahead and, and order these eight new vehicles. There's about a lead time of about four to five months in receiving them. Okay. Any questions from the board? Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. Vice Chairman Upson. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, th thank you. Um, 
Two, two big things. This is come out. Of, this did come out of a recommendation for, from the transportation committee. Um, I, I want to get right to the funding source because this is something that we talked about. We want to bring clarity for those who were not um, did, um, were not privy to the transportation committee um, that occurred. So um, it, this is money that was already in the budget. Um, uh, what and, and county administrator, please weigh in just to, for the record to be clear. Uh, what is the sources? All right. In other words, we know it's a, a total dollar, but where is this money being pulled from to source this? So there was 152, 153,000 that was set aside for other grants. Um, so it wasn't specifically earmarked, but there was. So this $113,000 match would come from that uh, money that was set aside for grants. All right. So I'll lean to my director of finance to weigh here in a minute. During the budget process, and let's just be fully transparent, we, we went back and forth regarding are we going to do the buses, not do the buses? And it was asked to take the buses out of um, our whole appropriation process. Some of y'all may recall that, some of y'all may choose not to recall it, and I understand. Um, however, through that process, though, the buses were taken out, but I had been to put the money in. Put the buses out, money in, just in case for a time such as this, right? So remember the $500,000 with the capital transportation fund, all right? So I want to be real clear that there's no misunderstanding of what happened. It was always there. It was just in case. If the bus didn't go for it, nothing broken, nothing lost. If it did, you had the funding for the buses. This is where we are. Uh, um, Director Hallman, please confirm that there was an excess amount sitting in there that was a, didn't have an earmark. Can you clarify that for us? Yes, that is accurate. We, um, Michelle and I, when we when Mark had asked us that question, we went back and looked just to verify, and there are <coughs> around one hundred and fifty-three thousand dollars that is included in Gary's budget, kind of set aside, uh, not earmarked for anything um, for a purpose like this. Okay. All right. So again, one more time for clarity, so that there's a, a consistent thread. Um, that was the intent, what it's always to be, to just make sure that we, we had proper funding for this and it would not be um, an amendment, Madam Chair, or in addition to it. In other words, we've already talked about this. All right, so I'm going to move that along. Um, second question, I'll yield, um, which is, you said a four to five month lead time. So that's what all of, what, February, maybe? Mm -hmm. Give or take? Mm -hmm. Late February. And we anticipate that this, um, again, we anticipate the system may be ready for a truly pilot. Give or take, you may test a couple things with our current fleet. But a pilot program, what, in the first quarter? Yes, sir. That, that's been my part of the last March 31st, right? Okay, same page. March 31st. <coughs> that being said, um, how long does it take to wrap it, get it going? I mean, what, I mean, you bought it, the asset is here, but how long does it take to really be ready to go? Um, I don't understand how you know, technology, whatever you're going to put on it, does it come fully equipped like a sheriff's car or do you have to go send it away once you get the raw asset to fix it? I'm just curious. It would be ready to go. The only thing that we would need to do was, was wrap it and for it to go through uh, the, the local inspections that we require through fleet and risk and safety. Okay. Uh, putting, we would have the decals, the wrap ready to go on it and that would be like a one or two day process. Okay. All right, so nothing material. So in other words, you, you, you're good, nothing. All right, All right I'm, I'm going to give you another one. Okay, Commissioner Geigo. Yes, Gary, uh, you had an FTA grant uh, that is a carryover. Is some of this money coming out of that? Uh, and I think you originally bought the four buses with the FTA. Yeah, we've, we've got... Have you depleted that? Well, we've got two existing FTA grants that we'll be purchasing these these vehicles from. Okay, has the CMAC money come in yet? No. Will it, it come in on a yearly basis, two million each year or whatever? It will come in on a reimbursement basis. So you have to pay for the equipment and then be reimbursed? Yes ma'am, but, okay. but as I've mentioned to several people before, the great thing about FTA is that their reimbursements are one day. If, if I if I request a reimbursement to them on Monday, we get so the Monday no on Tuesday. Right. <laughs> okay. So how much do you have in your FTA grants? 
Well, we've act, right now we've actually got four active FTA grants. That's excluding the voucher grant. Four active FTA grants, and there's right at $5 million in all of those grants <coughs> combined. Now, there's specific line items in those grants, and that's how you have to spend the money. But between two grants, we've got line items that easily cover the cost of these, these vehicles. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, any other questions? Thank you so much, Director Watson. Let's move on to tab number 10, authorization to approve an employment agreement with Joseph Pusak in the uh, uh, district attorney's office in order to fill a vacancy and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Mr. Lundin, he's not here, so county administrator, can you speak to this? Yes, ma'am, and the next one, too. Okay. Um, this is, uh, he's replacing a vacancy with uh, the previous employee left, Mr. Joseph Pusak, as a Assistant District Attorney. Okay. Same contract, same everything, no cost for the budget. Okay, but the new Budget new. Okay, any questions from the board? We'll move on to tab number 11, authorization to approve an employment agreement with J Jasmine Jackson as an assistant public defender in the state court in order to fill a vacancy and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents and uh, Director Miles, but I know she's not here speaking on her behalf. Yes, yeah, ma'am. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. This is the same thing, it's a replacement. Uh, personnel, they left for better opportunity. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so, and it's an assistant public defender <coughs> and budget neutral. Okay, budget neutral. Any questions from the board? We'll move on to tab number 12, authorization to amend the coordinates budget to cover the cost of indigent cremation. Uh, Director Holman. Good morning. Good morning. Um, yes, we brought this before um, the finance committee. Uh, we noticed that the um, coroner's line item for what we call pauper funerals or uh, cremations was going to be running short um, this year. Uh, so we wanted to go ahead and bring it before the board to amend our budget um, for something that to a certain extent and maybe Ken can elaborate a little bit. We have no choice but to pay um, the counties are responsible for indigent cremations and it's according to Georgia Code 36125. Uh, we had asked, or Michelle had reached out to the coroner to um, get a, a description or an explanation for um, the, the pauper funerals or the cremations. And she states that whenever a person dies in this state and the descendant, his or her family, and his or her immediate kindred are indigent and are unable to provide for the descendant's descent internet or a cremation, the governing authority of the county where wherein the death occurs shall make available from the county funds a sum sufficient to provide a cremation of a deceased indigent person or to reimburse such person as may have expended the cost thereof voluntarily. Um, she said, FYI, notice the law says that the county is responsible for all indigent deaths in the county. So if someone is visiting out of town and dies and can't afford it, then Douglas County by law is responsible for burial. Um, as to what determines someone is indigent in need of a pauper cremation or funeral, she said she did not know of a state law or standard on determining that. Each county is different and have different things in place. Some counties have had their own county attorney draw up a guideline or policy for the coroner to determine what makes the loved one indigent. Some counties work with their local defects office and let them screen the families to determine whether or not they will get an indigent cremation. She said that she could come up with a policy and a form and make it the next, uh, make the, uh, the next of kin sign and it basically says that the descendant has no assets and the next of kin has no assets. Uh, she said she would tell the families that she would be flagging that um, in the Douglas County in the probate office and the probate judge would call if someone comes and asks for the death certificate. She said, um, I also will not uh, let them have the remains until they reimburse the county 100% of our cost. I will explain to the families that there will be no service or anything and it will be cremation only. I know of another coroner that's had, she didn't mention what county, that had this in place and <coughs> he only had two indigent cases after he started that. So she also, I think you probably have attached to your agenda item, an affidavit that she um, has that she, you know, can start um, get people to sign. Um, as mentioned, it's about $995 for a cremation. 
Um, and the trends that you have attached, you can see since 2013, uh, they've been going up. In 13, there was 16 cremations. 14, there was 21. In 15, there was 29. In 16, there were 33. In 17, there were 36. And in 18, um, so far, through the month of August, there's been 31. Um, so looking at this and speaking with Michelle, it was my oversight and I apologize. The 16,000 would actually, based upon having around 32 cremations in eight months, that's about four cremations a month on average. So about $1,000 each, that's about $16,000 for September through December. Um, but we do need to add, she currently has about a $5,000 deficit. Um, in this line item for cremation, so it really needs to be a $21,000 amendment to the budget to take care of the deficit that had cremations through the month of August that have just now been processed. So I would like to ask for that to be changed to $21,000. At the time this was written, that paperwork had processed through the system. Mm -hmm. Any questions from the board? Commissioner mm -hmm. Davis? Yes. Um, Jennifer in May, May 15th of this year, she was right at 30%, which is where she should have been. Why all of a sudden is there a huge increase? There was a backlog of invoices. That's, um, can you remember the months? I know it went through August. Was it invoices from whom? Uh, the funeral homes. Um, the, the, the funeral homes. Funeral homes invoice, send the invoice to the coroner. And this last batch that came through, I think, was how much, Michelle? Around 11,000. About 11,000. And I think that was over a April, May, June, July, August. I'm not sure if it went as far as August, but I believe it went back as far as I know. Yeah. But uh, was her estimate for 2018 based on her 2017 numbers? We looked at that, and just because of the timing of invoices, and that's something that we can reach out to uh, Renee and have her ask the funeral homes to be more timely in sending their invoices. Um, at the time, her budget for 2018 is 25000 and right now through August, with, which includes August cremations, she's at 30, almost 31000 well, we have four um, funeral homes here that do cremations, but we're only utilizing two. And the two that we're utilizing is where her deputies work. Uh, I think that gives a perspective of uh, conflict of interest. I think it ought to be looked at that it's be spread out to all four. Um, uh, funeral homes, but uh, <clears throat> I just wondered why in the world it jumped from 2015, I mean, May 15th of this year to now, four months later, and why would they be holding the, the invoices? I don't, I don't I'm understand. Not sure. I just they should submit on a monthly basis, just like the coroners are supposed to. Mm -hmm. So, um, but uh, I do think that it ought to be looked at that only two funeral homes are being used and her deputies work at those funeral homes. Can I yield back? Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? <coughs> or, so, I just have a comment. Okay. My comment is related to the funeral homes um, because the funeral homes, I did do some research probably a while back. Didn't realize that the funeral homes are the ones that generate those invoices for those proper funerals, and they actually kind of decide, I guess, by looking at whether this per person's indigent. So it's almost we don't have the control that I would like to see. Mm -hmm. But of course, you can't argue with death. So I try not to do that. And, and um, so what I've looked at, and I'm just wondering, they, the funeral homes, and that's something we can do. Is she can do? Uh, when I say she, um, our coroner, put, put pressure to make sure they send them. In a timely manner yes. because they had a batch that came a little late. That yeah, because if it was $11,000, that's 11, so they roughly around four, you're looking at about three months. Well, these are, yeah, mm -hmm. so the funeral home is really kind of driving whether they are, if these people are uh, indigent or. That's a problem. Right? Yeah, <laughs> really, it is a big problem. It's, it's something that's really uh, something we can look into. <laughs> 
But the funeral home decides. I've had the question, I said, well, they decide whether they're indigent and then they process the invoice. So it's basically out of the coroner's hand, uh, out of her control. How she cannot control those uh, cremations, and that's something this board may want to look at. We may want to take a look at that because the, the invoice is coming to her. She can't tell the funeral home whether or not to process them or not. I've had dialogue with her. I said, look like we should have a little more handle, but I'm not sure if that's something we can do. I can certainly ask our attorney. She, is it something we can control, uh, attorney? I mean, I just don't know. Well, I'm not sure about the, the process, but I, I will say you can negotiate the rates, too. You don't have to just accept their, uh, their, their invoice. You can negotiate them ahead of time and, if necessary, beat them out. But the only caveat to what Jennifer <coughs> said would be if you have a, and I don't know how you would have this, but the Department of, if it's somebody in custody, the Department of Corrections will reimburse if it's a state custody, if they're in local county jails, you're responsible. But what she read is correct, and I think the problem is this, if you think about this law, whenever any person dies in this state and the decedent, his family, his immediate kindred are indigent, I mean, it almost require an investigative unit to figure out is not a cousin or somebody can't pay for this. And so we do need to have an affidavit form where it's subject to penalty of perjury for lying, but let's say this person can't, but you don't know all the family tree. So the law is just kind of a bad law, but I think these rates need to be negotiated in advance or they just don't go there anymore. Uh, as long as they see a deep pocket, they're going to keep billing the pocket and somebody needs to talk to them about it. Rates jump $30. $30. $40. $30. Okay. But I don't know. There, there's two two issues, I think, that address in that statement. It, it depends also how the body gets there. I mean, if the body is at the funeral home already, right. and then they determine there's indigency, what can you do about it? You're going right. to go pick up the body and bring it somewhere else versus where she has control of the body and there's nobody claiming it. Now, what do you do? Uh, so there's two scenarios. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Attorney. Commissioner Yeah. Uh, I think uh, two things. Two things are evident: is that we need some sort of policy, as Coroner alluded to, some course uh, to base an affidavit on, and you know, what the best route uh, of that would be. Uh, we've got bodies that have to be taken care of. It's our it's our responsibility. We can't uh, abdicate that responsibility. Uh, but we can certainly do the best by uh, taxpayer money. So I don't know about you know who works where or whatever, but if we've got four uh, fuel homes, uh, we need to see a little competition in the marketplace and see about driving these uh, per cremation mm -hmm. costs uh, down. And uh, I can support this uh, and have a commitment for the administration that will look into that and we'll see about driving these costs down. Mm -hmm. How long has this cost been nine? Have we been paying nine ninety five forever in the day? Or? Yeah, I mean, I know on the what we attached, we did it, you know, an average cost. Um, and I think sometimes maybe a smaller funeral home uh, may have charged a little bit less than nine ninety five. But on average, I would say since two thousand and ten, Michelle, it's been about nine hundred ninety five dollars. So since 2010, we've been paying $985. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's fluctuated. Yeah, it's fluctuated a little bit. But when you look at the primary four funeral homes here in Douglas County, it's $995. <coughs> I yield back. Okay, thank you. Uh, Vice Chairman Robinson. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, I want to be, we did discuss this on, in our finance committee, and it's something that, that it's a line item, and we have to pay it. Right? Um, this is not training, this is not um, discretionary, this is something we need to deal with. And so, um, yeah, I thought it prudent to bring it to the full board of commissioners to discuss, to your point, maybe with conditions, other rapids around it. But um, this was not a function of misjudging. You can't, you, you, we're not actuaries, we, we can't, we're not that good. We don't have actual sciences degrees here in Mass that we can sort of uh, project that. Right, it happens. Uh, no more than about what five years ago we had a situation. Uh, Commissioner Murphy, you might mention um, things could happen on mass, and now you've got five funerals at the same time. Right, and it, it turned out it was pauper. All right, so it, it's one of those where <coughs> this this line item right here focus on what we need to do right now, recognizing we've got a broader need of, of dealing with policy. So I, I want to separate the two. Um, the coroner did not miss forecasts on this situation. 
it happens. We have to amend accordingly based on volume. And so, uh, but I, I don't discount that this gives us opportunity to go deeper and strengthen <coughs> our policies on things that we've never done. Um, the 995, again, it, it's a number. I, I'm, I'm pretty open to that. I didn't know, Ken, is there, and this is the only question I had, it, does the state law, like in certain cases, thou shalt pay only this versus like probation and different things? It's, 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 it's so it's silent. Yeah, it's silent. Okay, all right, I, I got it. Continue point, mm -hmm. I, I, I can stand with it. Commissioner Wolf here on um, looking at negotiating. <coughs> okay. I yield. Thank, all right. you. Thank you. We'll move on to tab number 13. Authorization to approve an agreement with the Douglas County Board of Education for the addition of the school resource officer in the amount of $64,720.84 with salary and benefits being funded by the Board of Education and authorized the chairman to sign all related documents. Um, Major Holmes. Good morning, Madam Chair and fellow commissioners. Good morning. Um, the school system over the summer decided to add, I think they switched in uh, what we would know as the alternative school from the old days, a, a school system is put that back in place and they needed a school resource officer, resource officer and uh, they uh, agreed to, uh, to pay the salary and benefits for this position. Just so y'all know, of the 15, this person makes 15 school resource officers for the sheriff's office, not including what the city has. Of those, 11 of these 15 are funded by the school board, so that's, a, that's something I don't know if a lot of folks know, but that's, that's a benefit. The school board helps us out on that. So, um, the only thing that the county pays for is we pay for one school resource officer for each high school, not to include Douglas County because it's in the city. So just a mm -hmm. little bit of information for you. <coughs> Any questions from the board? Okay, thank you. It's pretty self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. Next we'll move to tab number 14, authorization to negotiate a contract with KCI Technologies Incorporated to provide consultant services for the transportation sloping uh, study for the I-20 at Chapel Hill Road diverging, diverging diamond interchange. Dr. Peacock. Yes, ma'am. This is one of the uh, two items that I'll have with you before you today. This is for the consulting services, as, as you read, for the uh, I-20 at Chapel Hill uh, Road, the Virgin Diamond inter Interchange. We went out for bid uh, for this uh, consultant uh, on June the 5th of 2018. We received the bids back in on June the 29th. We received uh, five proposals. Uh, we went through a phase one evaluation of those five and narrowed <coughs> the field down to two and went to a phase two evaluation uh, with KCI Technologies uh, coming out as the one that we thought could best meet the needs of the county. Uh, so as uh, we've already started the negotiation process, we met with them by phone on Friday and went through the scope and um, uh, didn't really talk about fees too much, but talked about the scope and made sure we were all on board. So uh, the DOT uh, uh, administration and purchasing is recommending that you allow us to continue that negotiation to come up with a final contract with KCI Technologies. Okay. Any questions from the board? Commissioner Iger. Uh, yes, Bill. We did this once before, did we not? On Chapel Hill, the diamond uh, diversion. Mm -hmm. I'm not aware of it. Uh, it would have been before my time if you did. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we, had, we were about to issue a grant, a get, a, get a grant for it, and then the city wouldn't sign off on it. That's when, uh, and so, can't we use the same scope? <laughs> uh, you'd have to really direct that question to Miguel and let him, yeah. Director Valentin, and see what he says. <laughs> Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, Good morning. I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> Uh, we have uh, had all this done, prepared to even apply uh, for the grant at one point when the city said, no, I don't, we don't want it, and so it was dropped. Would we not still have all that in our file so we could just kind of update it? No, uh, the, the effort that, that was done some years ago was very limited in scope. And it was intended just to support a grant application. This is actually beginning the concept stage of a project design that will eventually develop construction plans and uh, build whatever the ultimate design uh, we arrive at. 
So we're not applying for any grant for this at all? Oh, yeah, it, it is. The, the, uh, the design effort is partially funded. Uh, I don't remember exactly, <coughs> but it has federal funds in it. So it, it, it's partially funded with federal funds. Uh, when we move ahead for this uh, scoping phase of the design. So this is just to design it, but uh, well, for some reason I thought the design was already out there before. No, what was done was was a, a, a concept uh, investigation to support a, a grant application, uh -huh. which is just very limited in scope. It doesn't go into the level of detail <coughs> that you need to in order to move a design forward. Okay, I yield back. Okay. Any other questions for Public Works? Okay, next I'll move on to tab number 15, authorization to negotiate a contract with Pond and Company Incorporation to provide consulting services for the transportation scoping st study for the Lee Road Extension Project. Uh, Director Peacock? Yes, ma'am. It's same tune, same story. We um, sent out this request on June the 5th. Uh, we received the um, responses back on June the 29th. Uh, we went through the phase one evaluation. Uh, we narrowed uh, this down to three firms. Uh, then we went back and did the, had them submit their uh, uh, phase two qualifications. <coughs> we went through the evaluation and we um, uh, are asking now that the commission uh, allow us to negotiate the final contract, contract with Pond and Company. Again, we met with them by phone this past Friday and started talking about the, the scope to make sure everybody understood what it was that we were looking to have them do and, and some of the uh, particulars that we think are important in their in product. So we've started the process and we just want you guys to allow us to continue that and come bring a contract price back to you. Okay. Any questions from the board uh, Commission Bryson? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we, we discussed this during our transportation committee and I, I wanted to clarify um, and, and my question then, I'll just bring it to the full board, was, was this not part of uh, the funding that we provided um, for Lee Road? Let's start with that question. I want the full board to hear the answer. Miguel, um, will you please come back up and deal with this question? I'm sorry. Could yeah, you repeat I'll repeat the it. Question? No problem. So we talked about it in the Transportation Committee, um, which is I thought we provided funding for a design on Lee Road. Uh, clarify whether this deals with the widening or the extension or the master plan. There's a lot of consulting dollars going around, so I'm going to start with that. Please clarify. Understood. Uh, this does <coughs> not deal with the segment of Lee Road uh, where the widening project, uh, as we know and have discussed, uh, is located. This is actually the extension of Lee Road south of State Route 92, south of Urban Road. Uh, there is a segment, uh, a little stub road, several hundred feet in length, and <clears throat> directly across the intersection of Urban Road and Lee Road. And it will, it will project from that location southward towards eventually in the direction of Chapel Hill Road. So that element, uh, <coughs> this is a scoping study to facilitate establishing the alignment uh, moving forward of that element. There is also a planning study in the same general area but is totally independent from this exercise. In essence, uh, that will deal with uh, the zoning and land use and potentially uh, uh, issues of what will the county want to see in that area happen in the future, as opposed to this exercise where we're looking at projecting an arterial corridor to provide mobility to that area. Right, right. Thank you. So one is a road and one is an area. Correct. Two separate projects, which brings me to my next question that I brought up, and I just again for the, for the body of the whole. Um, <coughs> funding. Uh, is this coming out of your budget? Is it coming out of SPLOST? Is it coming out to capital transport? I mean, where, where's the source of funding for this? Again, we just want to clarify because there's a lot going on in this area, and it just just so for the public and the press can be clear on what this is, please. Yes, uh, Commissioner, the, the funding for this project is again shared federal funding, as well as uh, some uh, local match out of the capital transportation fund. 
And um, this, that, and, and I want to direct to Peacock, um, we've already, we're facilitating this right now. When do we expect um, the design work to be done? That's where we are with this. The design work will, <coughs> it will take until this uh, early spring of next year. Actually, this this level of, of design, this is the uh, what's referred to as a two-phase design. It is the <coughs> scoping element of the design where it sets the alignment and the parameters. So this will be completed. They're looking at about a year to complete this exercise. And then, if we're ready to move forward and if the funding is in place, we will move to actual final design of the construction uh, drawings for that project. Okay. All right. But again, this is not a SPLOS project. Therefore, the funding wouldn't come out of economic development like some of the other things have been done. We're separating two. So this is us at the county within our capital transportation fund and a grant that we already had in place. Is that correct? That's my understanding. Okay. Cool. Although it could be paid for out of SPLOS because it is economic development. But that'd be up to the board. Which is really my segue. You knew where I was going with this. Which is where, where should it come from? Um, <coughs> you have options on the table. Um, I'm, I was pretty open. It was, it was actually in the agenda to say that it came as a recommendation for that, and that we didn't agree to that. We agreed that the funding should be done, but as far as the source, I want to be clear. I want the full board to weigh in on that. So um, I, I respect that we yield to <coughs> feedback, Madam Chair. I'd like to solicit other people's thought. We leave it as is, as recommended. Um, but in any event that the board wishes something different, there was no. Um, there was no resistance from the, from the committee. And we will bring back the final negotiated price to the board. And we don't, so this authorization that we're asking for is not. It's just authorization. Yeah, it's just authorization to negotiate. You hear that? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Commissioner Mulk here. Uh, thank you. Uh, I don't have many more opportunities to get on the soapbox about, about, this, uh, uh, about this plan. Yeah. Uh, this I'll call it the East uh, Douglas County's version of the East East West connector. I <coughs> call it uh, huge, huge positive impact in, in terms of traffic flow. If everybody in this room thinks about how many times they have to go through the Douglasville <coughs> City <coughs> core, uh, be it Fairman Road, Chapel Hill Road, or Highway Five, or whatever, to get on the interstate, and this. Uh, this corridor will have, the, have the, the benefit of drawing people away from the city that just want to go to Atlanta or, or Birmingham, Alabama or, or, and places in between. Huge, huge traffic flow and congestion um, solution. And but having said that, the very tightly wound to that is, is the real economic catalyst that it will be all, all along this, uh, this corridor. Uh, so I agree. We we need to pursue forward and commit uh, commit funding to this right now, and then have as uh, the vice chairman alluded to, uh, have a further discussion where the money uh, should come from. Uh, but I'm a strong proponent that this is a, a huge e economic development issue. Uh, if you think uh, long term, long term, thinking about connecting the Lee Road Bridge uh, all the way around to uh, Highway 78. On the west side of the county. Now, that's not the that's not the near term solution. Uh, it'll be more like the Chapel Hill Road, but uh, mm -hmm. huge economic development uh, catalyst, and uh, uh, this is a, a great thing for the county. So I yield back. Thank you, Commissioner Geiger. Yes, um, Michelle. Well, first of all, I think we ought to put in the um, on the agenda. What leg is as far from Lee Road? Because Lee Road just keeps popping up. And if you're searching anything, you, you're not able to find which one you're looking for. So this is from for the expansion of Lee Road from 92 over to Chapel Hill. It what? has nothing to do with the uh, leg that's under, we just bought all the right-of-ways. Uh, <coughs> Widening. The, the widening yeah. of Lee Road from the bridge over to 92. That is correct. And, and this uh, <coughs> preliminary analysis is going to look at that entire corridor to Chapel Hill Road. However, I would anticipate that in all likelihood, 
any construction will be split in phases. Mm -hmm. So it won't necessarily uh, have a design for the entire corridor to be built all at the same time because of the cost, mm -hmm. approximately three miles of roadway. But it will analyze the entire corridor to make sure that if you proceed to uh, take traffic and aim it in that direction towards Chapel Hill, that Chapel Hill Road is going to be able to absorb and, and deal properly with that additional traffic. Okay. So, so how much would the match come out of our capital transportation fund? Because we all know that it's pretty <coughs> low right now. I don't, I don't have those figures with me right now. I can get them to you. Uh, and I, but I, I'm hesitant to give you numbers, uh, particularly because we're in the process of uh, designing, uh, of, of negotiating a design <coughs> contract. So I would not want uh, to uh, broadcast what, what the amounts are. Well, I understand where we need to plan ahead and everything, but I caution the board to take everything out of this uh, $10 million that was set aside just for economic development because we haven't done anything with the widening part yet. We may need some of those funds for, for that project. So uh, we, we just need to remind ourselves that that $10 million is just not a slush slush fund and that any road project can be considered an economic development um, uh, project <coughs> because you're going to open up another road and it could be uh, commercial or whatever but I think we we need to uh, kind of hesitate to use that $10 million that was put aside for economic development for projects that we've already started, we've already started, and that we need to develop that first before we use it up for something that's going to be done 10 years after. <coughs> the um, splash is not going to last, but like four more years, four more years, mm -hmm. four, four more years. Mm -hmm. So. To me, we need to uh, use that money for uh, what we've got on the table now. You know, complete a project before we start using it for another project. But um, I just um, I was concerned. I'm concerned about the tra capital transportation fund, as Commissioner Robinson stated. We took five hundred thousand to fund buses in the budget 2018. So it's going down. We took a million dollars out of it for the budget for 2018. That 500 and the other 500. <coughs> so we need to we need to maintain the capital transportation fund for what it was set up to maintain. In case we get a grant for this diamond diversion and the, we can uh, have the matching funds taken out of it. Things like that that we never know what's going to, the state may say, well, we're going to redo the intersection down on Maria Road. Well, if we don't have the matching funds, it may not get done. Things like that that it was intended to be used for, and we need to be careful about the pleading. Yeah, and Commissioner, Commissioner to, to that point, that is precisely the situation here. Both of these projects... Uh, were allocated funding from the capital transportation fund because we knew they were coming and uh, so they have both federal funds and funding already allocated from the capital fund. They're already split out of the 500,000 we've got in the, in the capital transportation They already have <laughs> the, the local match is already earmarked uh, uh, at least the local match based on the originally anticipated amount. We, that may change somewhat. We'll find out when we finalize the negotiations, but um, over the last year or so, those t both of these projects have been allocated funding out of the capital transportation fund. But they're included in the balance. They are. The capital transportation fund of just a half a million dollars. Uh, they are outside of the <coughs> remaining <coughs> on our data funds. Yeah, yes. Okay, so that is, 
In other words, it's been allocated but hadn't been spent. Correct. I got you. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I yield back. Oh. Richard, you have a thing? Yes, I did. Yeah. Okay. Just, uh, how many possible phases that this may or may not be, or that you anticipate? Because I know when we talk about phases uh, of this particular project. You're talking about construction phases? Right, yes. I would say a minimum of two. Okay, got it. And likelihood of two. Got it. And, and, and the reason I'm asking that is to try to look at how the dollars could be allocated in kind of kind of the structure of how many phases. I thought there were probably more phases than just that, though. But with that being said, though, um, I think yes is going to have a huge economic impact on us, and, and it's a huge plus. But the question is, if we allocate SPLOS funding to, to possibly do it, not a bad idea. But the other question I would only add to us to make sure we caution ourselves: what is already in, in there on the SPLOS layout that we already know that we had planned to do? Mm -hmm. uh, but. From the committee recommendation, I'm, I, I would think that uh, the chair and vice chair will probably come back with some form of a recommendation as to what it <coughs> looks like, what it could be, what the thought process is. But I'm open because uh, it does make sense. And plus, I don't want to lose any federal and state dollars possibility. Um, so if that's the case, then we may have to look in the general fund and other places or, or the transportation funds just because. Um, but again, I, I think I'll, I'll love to see kind of what the feedback comes back from uh, that committee and, and what that looks like before we kind of either move forward. But I think it's something that's, that we definitely take a hard look at. Though. But thanks for the information about what we all did that. So I do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mark, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope I close this out. Uh, to, to, to borrow an often used phrase from our, our vice chairman, uh, you know, it may not be uh, either or. It, right. it could, actually could be a combination. It actually could be both. It could be from yes. uh, internal funds and, and SPAS funds, a combination there, yes. or even in varying percentages, 70, 30, or yes. you know, whatever. So, so that's a great discussion for a, a later time period. Yes. The fact is, we're moving forward with this, with this huge, huge project. How you go back? Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, you just break full. <laughs> no, no, I want to. I want to deal with the phases that we talked about with this again, because this this is related. And again, I, I appreciate Commissioner Bolkier's uh, involvement, because again, uh, in three months from time from now, we won't have his his senior statesman at the table. So I think for this corridor is is relevant, and so I, I want to mark this. Um, phase one was the bridge. Phase two was from the bridge down to. Beverly Road phase three was supposed to go north of the bridge to 78, and then this final phase is supposed to go to Beaumont. That's not, I mean, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I just want to clarify, Miguel, you, this is sort of how we talked about it from a language perspective. So how you <laughs> formally define that, you're okay, this was, you know, before Miguel, right? All right, so I just wanted to, Henry, to your point, I don't want to discount uh, perhaps your district, what was coming. Right. And that, uh, mm -hmm. and that in, in your exchange, your, your, your district wasn't on the table, so I want to bring that back. So just for the record, uh, the bridge down to 92, north to 78, right. and then all the way across um, Beaumont to Chapel Hill. Yes, yes. Okay. Are we clear? No, no, no absolutely. I just, no. Just, just so it didn't get slipped. Second part was, uh, this, this begets a bigger picture. Put the capital transportation fund to the side. We'll bring that up during um, the budget process and appropriation. and you know, where the money went and all that, what, 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 how we replenish <coughs> it and so forth. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. But I do want to come back to the economic development component. Uh, that $10 million was, was, was part of the SPLOS, and it did have purpose. Um, again, that was something that was important. Um, and uh, we, 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 we didn't put really rules around SPLOS at all, right? We, we had our percentages, but the project was sort of loose. But within transportation, we had this economic $10 million earmark. I got to bring this back around now. That ten million dollars initially was around um, um, Thornton Road. That whole commitment that we did. If in fact we need to do something up there um, to enhance, uh, because we really didn't have rules. It was sort of like, well, we got this need over here on Lee Road, too, right? That ten million can't be spent on these threefold projects. I don't care how you're going to look at it. it it's going to have limitations, <coughs> right? So you're going to have to pick one. Right, this is so, I, so Miguel, you know, Mark, you know, um, our director of uh, economic development are going to have to have that conversation is that while we're talking about all of this, guys, we got limited dollars. Right? Now, you may be able to do it, flip it, reuse that money, but that's going to be over time. Mm -hmm. 
And so I think there's some credence. Mm -hmm. I took away from Madam <coughs> Guider's point, which is, okay, guys, we only got 10 million, less than that, but let's just say for the sake of the conversation, you got 10 million, right? It may take you 6 million to buy this parcel of land. It may take you 7 million to finish out Thornton Road. You, you won't be able to do both. You may be able to do parts of it. And I think what we're trying to do is leverage the design work, the consulting work that we can do, I think is appropriate. But at some point, we're going to have to declare a major and commit. And so I, I want to be careful with um, the public in setting <coughs> expectations, because this is where I'm struggling. You're talking about Lee Road, which y'all killing me on Lee Road. I see some, when are you going to repave that? All right, you repave, what, 78 being done, Thornton <coughs> Road has been done, Riverside has been done, Fairburn Road has been done, but that's a major corridor. All right, it's already six years behind. Right, so we're setting expectations with these conversations and stuff. It's like, okay, and I'm looking at y'all like, okay, now how are you going to do Thornton Road and this? But you're setting expectations with language to the public that, okay, we're going to be going down this street. You know, you want me to wait another five years for y'all to figure this out, knowing that we got money that may be going. It, see, that we got to be real careful. And again, I, I have to be careful as the advocate for District 2 uh, because this, this, this has impact. Right, so you're doing this design work, and I'm fine with that. But I'm like, okay, but are you going to be able to get this done to, to the points that we've made right now? <coughs> and so, so now you got you got to set expectations with the public because that's how we as elected officials get in trouble if you don't message right, right? If you don't get out there and start selling. Look at us. Look what we're doing. Look what we're doing. It's like, okay, but what is the probability of that coming off real time? So I, I, I ask that uh, commissioner, uh, my commissioners, to be sensitive to that. That at some point we're going to have to help with the decision mm -hmm. um, to sort of like, okay, it, 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 again, it's our full pleasure in board, <coughs> but I want to be careful that we, we need to get there sooner or later. Um, the money's going to run out. Uh, it's got to be either or. Uh, and again, well, one time I said, we'll take this 10 million and leverage it up to the state and feds. I mean, can I turn that into 20, 30 million? So it ain't just, don't just burn it. How do I optimize that capital stack in such a way that the 10 becomes 20 or 30 versus we're just burning down this 10 million. So again, I, I challenge us to think through that. I'm going to yield, I just need to clarify that, just bring it back around. Because it, it is something that, okay, well, I need to resurface Lee Road this year because this is, the citizens like, okay, y'all been saying this for BU five years, right? So if I res re resurface Lee Road while y'all still figuring this out, that's going to be throwaway once y'all begin to widen, but it, okay, I can't wait another five years for y'all to figure this out. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm faced with this, like Commissioner Robinson, our car is being torn up. Uh, well, Miguel, you know this, I call you every other day about potholes. So th this is just for the public. This is not me with Miguel. It's just, just a, a public sentiment that we, we're going to have to get this right. We're gonna, we can't kick the can, and it, it, it's unfortunate that things didn't go like it was planned because of the recession, because of whatever happened. But now we have to recalibrate. So, Miguel, thank you for your patience to help us get through this very hard decision. Madam Chair, I yield. Sir. Okay. We're going to move right on to the next one. Tab yep. number 16, authorization to create a new position of project engineer in the Transportation Department to manage, inspect, and oversee the construction of transportation projects and coordinate testing for quality assurance to be funded by the 2016 SWAST funds. Director Valentin. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. This, this element, as we look ahead of, uh, to the projects that are going to go into construction towards the end of this year and in the spring of 2019, uh, it became apparent and fairly obvious the urgency for us to have one main individual in the county uh, whose, whose main purpose is going to be to inspect all of these projects and make sure that they're meeting the specifications, they're following the appropriate standards. And that's not to say that this individual will be able to do all of the projects that we may have going uh, at any given time. However, this will be the individual to coordinate mm -hmm. all of the efforts, whether it be the testing, the scheduling, <coughs> the inspections, the approval of uh, perhaps submittals from contractors. So this is going to be a key position to be able to move all of these projects going forward. Uh, there are going to be projects that will not be able to be done under the auspices of uh, an inspection protocol of this individual because they, they can be pretty sizable, such as the Lee Road widening project. Once that one breaks, we will need to have some coordination done at the county level 
However, the main effort is going to be outside of the scope of this one. But uh, this is a, a well-needed uh, position to be able to manage the projects that are coming down the pipeline. Okay. Any questions, Commissioner Geiger? Miguel, I was under the impression that squash funds were supposed to be used for capital funds, not personnel. The SPLOS funds can be used to further the capital projects that are funded under the SPLOS. And as such, they can also be used, as my understanding, uh, they can also be used to fund uh, employees that support those projects as well. Has legal looked at this? Have you looked at this? I don't know that I specifically have. I can say, generally speaking, if you had a program manager that was tied to a SPOS program, that would be, depending upon the verbiage of the SPOS referendum, that would be appropriate in <coughs> a potential expenditure. But you couldn't have somebody that was under the aliases of SPOS doing 90% of non-SPOS work. That would be a no-no, so I'd have to, I don't know the position. Yeah. Uh, Mark says I looked at it and gave an opinion. That's what I get for going on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have my opinion? <laughs> Generally speaking, you can use SPOS funds to fund a position that furthers the SPOS program. I don't, did I say anything different than the no. opinion? You can't. <clears throat> and I was hired to do the same in 1994 at another location, but yes, you can do that. You can use SPOS funds for personnel. Yes, ma'am, you can. <clears throat> okay. I yield back then. Okay. And it's cheaper than hiring a consultant to do this same work. You know, but we, we, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> what have we done in the past? We, uh, this, this new position is going to be inspecting the quality of work that our vendors do. Don't we have people on staff that can do that now? Unfortunately, we do not have um, enough qualified staff, or should I say qualified, enough staff to go around on these projects. What we actually have done in the past, the one project that we have underway at Stuart Mill and Yancey, is we've hired that out to a consultant at considerably higher expenditure for a single project than this position would entail to handle all of those projects. So they're going to say, well, uh, you didn't use the right aggregate raw whatever uh, they, they would they would do field inspections they would monitor submittals they would ensure that the testing that is done meets the criteria our criteria uh, GDOC criteria that we rely on so this would be a quality control uh, inspection position uh, to make sure that we're getting our money's worth well, um, and I've often stated this in the meetings, that I think that when we pave a new road, that the lip of that pavement ought to be addressed by that person. <coughs> because we pave a road, it's got a big lip on it, and then big tractor trailers come on it, and they break it off, and we're constantly pay, um, fixing the lip of the pavement. Uh, we've done that uh, just last year, I think, we paved um, West Stuart Mill Road, and there's all kinds of chips on the, on the side, and when I, I'm, I'm saying chunks, where the traffic has run off the shoulder. And if we don't address the shoulders when we put down a new pavement, then I think we're, we're missing doing, you know, following through on the project. So. Um, have y'all ever considered uh, the shoulder <coughs> on the road? Uh, I think at one time we even had a contractor that went back and fixed the shoulder when a new pavement was put on it. Because you're adding several inches to the Yes. Uh, uh, and, uh, Commissioner, to, you, to your point, we have in fact done that and uh, some of the designs that we have now uh, underway that will be going to construction do exactly that. In addition to the width of the pavement, there is a another two feet on either side of the pavement that is hardened. The base is put in place. It's not paved. So to the eye, it looks like it's uh, lawn. Um, but in, in fact, if a vehicle goes off the edge, 
uh, you have at least a, a wheel uh, with well, a couple of feet so that it doesn't rot out the edge. So yes, mm -hmm. we are taking that into account on all the projects going forward. Now, going if the, forward, no, we haven't been doing it in the past. No, we years. have not been doing it in the past because it is an additional expense. Uh, if, <coughs> if the project it, has curbing, then It protects you, what we put down on the money we use to put down that Understood, money. understood. Uh, if the project has curbing, then obviously you would not need to do that because the wheels would bounce off of the curb if they meet that, if they uh, go off their lane. But uh, anything that is uh, the old uh, uh, rural type construction where the side is even with the road, then we are incorporating this additional well, shoulder Well, I would part. suggest you look at West Stuart Mill Road, which is not rural. You've got a school there, a lot of cut through traffic going to Highway 5 to Stuart Mill Road, and um, there's a lot of <coughs> damage already to the pavement that was done a year or so ago. Yeah, and, and by, by rural, I, I didn't mean in terms of the land use, I meant in terms of the design parameters. Well, there's some curving on West Stuart Mill Road. It's not all the way down, but there's some curving. But because it's in and out of the city, but uh, you might want to look at it. <laughs> Thank you. I go back. Okay. Turn to Mark. Yeah. You have a comment. Yeah, I, Mark sent me my email, from, <laughs> which is always good to find your emails. Uh, the position I looked at was Sploss Construction Inspector, which I'm told by Mark this is going to be Sploss Program Manager, and if that's the same, yeah, the funds can be used from Sploss to fund that position that's tied to Sploss. So long as you stay within the category and the percentage, and they're not doing non sploss related work. If they're doing non sploss related work, then there are other issues that need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Commissioner okay. Moore? Yeah, I, I want to circle back to this project and okay. engineer. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to delve into some of our past history, mm -hmm. where I think, frankly, we, we uh, have come up wanting. But uh, this position, and we're talking a lot about the inspection and so forth, we're really talking about a lot of uh, uh, state and federal required compliance with specifications and financial tracking, specifically. Is that accurate? There is certainly all of that entailed within this position. The financial tracking itself, there is another position that would have a main responsibility for that. But this is to ensure quality control on the projects. Okay, I yield back. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Robinson. Yeah, I mean this. This uh, again. This this to get our last meeting that we had when we were doing street light conversation, and it was expressed that okay, perhaps no inspections were done. Um, I want to. Um, how much? Is, so I'm, I'm I'm giving some context. To, so we're a year and a half in on our splos. Uh, this would be tied to splos, right? Um, it, is it true, and I'm, I'm only asking because I don't know the answer, is that the projects that have been delivered, were they inspected at all? Let's start there. Yes, they, they were inspected by in-house personnel. Various components were inspected. For example, we would have had someone for our, from our maintenance division to go and look at certain components. We would have had our utilities uh, inspector go in and coordinate that. So there were uh, many of the components of inspection that were inspected with in-house staff, yeah. but, but that was pooling individuals from different areas throughout the department. So what we're saying is that with, with the beginning of the vertical construction, with a lot of stuff that's about to speed up here, we're saying that we've reached the capacity because I think the spirit of this is uh, we did purposely doing this floss program manager to select the moral and Russell team we told us to eliminate this this function that we thought we could do in-house um, hindsight is always 2020 um, so uh, while I know um, our pro um, our purchasing director did a great job of negotiating keeping us under four points on on, on that uh, th there probably was an opportunity to sort of uh, do it right. I mean, again, we can't do everything internally. There's, a, there's something about scale, uh, and there's a reason for outsourcing. So I won't belabor that. I, I support this in the sense that 
I wish we would have, you know, if the collective board would have went forward, we wouldn't be in this exposed point. But so, what is the cost of this? Let me just nobody said it. It's uh, the overall. I think it's around a hundred thousand dollars. That includes benefits, though, correct? Right? Including benefits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to bring that back full circle that this, again, we're a year and a half on in something. And again, we learn. We, we learn our own capacity, realize, okay, I, I can't lift that. And so I think it's the right move. I just wish we would have went ahead and did with this ahead of time. So I yield my chair. I just want to commend you on the North Helton Road. <laughs> I've got more kudos from people at church <laughs> on that one road. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Mitchell. Just, just one. So, is this a temporary position, or yeah. no, this, this will, will be, be permanent? This will be a permanent position. So as long as as long as the the SPLOS funding is available. So <coughs> I would say temporary to SPLOS yes. funds. Mm -hmm. So once SPLOS funds are over, this person will or this position. Will may or may not, depending upon what this board decides, go away. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. And 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 just to um, uh, refrain, I mean, re reflect on what uh, Vice Chair spoke about. Uh, yes, we we tried this on our own. Uh, we see now that it requires a lot to try to do it on our own. And and I just would say to this board, be prepared because I think there's some other areas of improvement that's forthcoming uh, when it, we're dealing even with the, the parks and rec side of this. So just FYI, uh, that the need is just the same. And I yield back. Okay. Um, Director Valentin, uh, certainly myself and Commissioner Guidance have just, just hampered on those <coughs> shoulders, those worn shoulders out there. And I'm just delighted that this administration has taken a, a, an advanced approach with making sure that you're using the best uh, practice for those shoulders. What are we going to do to go back and look at the ones that were prior, uh, maybe five, six years ago? Can we go back and shore those up a little bit just to, to give them that uh, type of uh, solidity? We, we certainly can, uh, Madam Chair. It is, of course, a very large county, as you know. <laughs> and and uh, But as we have the opportunity and as, as the uh, reports come in of needs in different areas of the county we do go out and stabilize those sections however as you can imagine if you have a, a mile long segment of road uh, that was not stabilized in that manner there, there is the potential over time for there to be many such incidents of people wandering off the edge of the pavement and, and rotting it out but we continue to make those maintenance uh, address the maintenance required on, on that. Uh, in terms of a comprehensive uh, effort, something to consider, uh, but it is uh, it is quite a task. Okay, thank you for the response. All right, we'll move on to the next item. Thank you so much, Director Valentin. Tab number 17, authorization to approve a purchase and sale agreement for the purchase of <coughs> land located in Fair Play for purposes of the building for building of a telecommunications <coughs> tower and authorize the chairman to sign all related docu documents subject to final legal review. Legal. Marsh, go ahead. Marsh, okay. um, okay. Yes, ma'am. These are the sites we previously discussed down at Fair <coughs> um, for the tower for one of the towers for the 800 megahertz radio system. So we finally have the purchase and sale agreement ready. Um, this will allow us to go on the property, do an environmental phase one, um, and then go forward from there. Any questions from the board, Commissioner Geiger? Just to comment, um, Mark, this is necessary for the radio system. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is a safety issue for the people in Fairplay. Yes, ma'am. And, and, uh, and the and the county, and the county, uh, both for the uh, the sheriff's office and the fire department. This is uh, nobody likes towers, uh, and we tried to get it placed on the school property and. Uh, they were they they didn't want it on their property for some reason, but we we had to find a certain area in which to place that pole. We had no choice. Yes, ma'am. Either that, or we were going to have to scrape the whole uh, radio system. So uh, I just want people down there. There may be some people that are 
unhappy because it's going to be a pole down there, but it's necessary for safety. That's so nice just part. wanted everybody to, I wanted it on record. <coughs> we don't just arbitrarily uh, put uh, poles around, <laughs> and towers. When I say a pole, I mean towers. Towers. Okay. I yield back. Okay. So one other comment. Okay. I move on to tab number 18, authorization to approve a memorandum of understanding <coughs> with Austell Napa VS system for purposes of building a telecommunications tower and authorize the chairman to design all related documents subject to final uh, legal review. Mark it then. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Gas owns a piece of property on Highland, <coughs> which is sort of in the corner, it'd be south of the corner of Thornton Road and Lee Road. Um, so they have allowed us, or they are allowing us, through this memorandum of understanding, um, to put a tower on their property and have ingress and egress at no cost. Okay. Any questions from the board? Okay. A great, uh, a great comparison to the to the previous uh, item where we're having to buy property and not place it on the school board property, but actually having to pay money to place this public safety uh, <coughs> infrastructure. Uh, great neighbor, and I would like to see the board uh, extend a, a personal letter of thanks, or perhaps from the chairman, okay. uh, to uh, all uh, natural gas for letting us use part of the property. I yield back. Okay. And, and Madam Chair, the reason why you can enter into a multi-year deal with all, all still, uh Gas is it's a quasi-governmental entity. It actually comes out of the city of Allstell. It's got a separate board, but it's a quasi-government, so it allows for a longer-term deal. That's why this is 20 years with five-year renewals that I offer. Okay. Thank you. It's good to know. All right, tab number 19, authorization to approve an employment agreement with Jamie's Dapper Port, I mean Dapper Mont, in the uh, Juvenile Programs Administration uh, Department as case manager, specialized services, and authorized the chairman to sign all related documents. Um, good morning. Good morning. Um, this is just to replace. For, for the camera angle. Okay. <laughs> camera angle. And the micro <laughs> microphone. Yes. I had a, resign a resignation in my department, and this is just the authorization to approve um, a contract with a new employee. It's filling a vacant position. Okay. Any questions from the board? Pretty self-explanatory. Bud budget neutral. Yes. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. All right. Next, I um, asked the clerk to see if you could reach out and, uh, for our, to all our committees. Uh, so you all can provide an update. It's been a minute since we've had an update. Usually want to go with a quarterly update, but I think we've had, this is considered six months, <laughs> six months ago. And I would like to just uh, um, ask all the committees if they could report out this morning. Just give us um, uh, abbreviated version versus a, a dissertation. Um, the start of Parks and Recreation Oversight Committee, uh, Commissioner Mitchell. So if you're saying you don't want us to give you the, the full blown, you want to. <laughs> no, you can. You can That's more of a dissertation. All right. Okay, so we'll, we'll start with the uh, Parks and Rec uh, Committee. John, I mean, uh, uh, Jim, Jim. I'm sorry, I'm saying John. Jim, if you want to kind of update us, update the board about where we are, what we've done, and all the, the great things that are going on in Parks and Rec. Good morning, Madam Chair, Board of Commissioners. Good morning. Um, since the last time we were updated on March 19th, we've made over 15 recommendations to the board. Um, just a few of those include the upgrade of the medicine control system at Boundary Waters Aquatic Center, a, uh, a recommendation to award a contract to Carter Watkins for the architectural design services of the senior center with the uh, SPLOS, the recommendation for the Board of Commissioners to approve an invitation to bid for construction of the Boundary Waters concession stand and press box, an invitation to bid for sports lighting for three athletic fields at Fair Play Park, and to award a contract for architectural design services to Carter Watkins Associates for the design of the Deer Lick Park tennis courts and restroom facilities. Also, we have an invitation to bid for construction services for con concession and restroom facilities at Bill Lock Park as well, and a contract with integrated construction for the construction of a concession stand and press box of Boundary Waters Park at a cost of $709,747.34. So you see kind of the progression there. 
We've also, a lot of our recommendations have also been from the SPLOST equipment line. Uh, most of that equipment has gone to maintenance and we actually purchased, uh, the first thing I mentioned, the medicine system was also purchased out of our SPLOST equipment line. Right. Okay. Um, just, just to add on part three, I think uh, it, it's been going exceptionally well and the committee has kind of removed um, from SPLOS to just things that are just to be safety issues and safety concerns. But I think we've done well to include uh, Vice Chair uh, uh, with the layout of the boundary waters, um, uh, uh, addressing the community address those concerns about what they would like to see in that particular makeup and the, the weeks that it stayed at boundary waters to the Gearlick side of things. So, um, I mean, I think we've done a great job thus far in Parks and Rec. I don't think anybody got any questions for us or for Any myself. questions? For, for, I mean, for um, Parks and Recreation and for Commissioner Mitchell. I just want to just say great job. Y'all made a lot of progress. Oh, yes. Uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. Right. Thank you, yes. And, and just a special thanks to uh, Vice Chair uh, <coughs> Malk here and all the hard work that he put in. And I, and I know he's on his way, you know, retirement and going fishing, but we, we still gonna hang on to him and keep him in the headlock as so do. Um, programming committee, uh, I thought I saw a quick around. Oh, oh, there he is, okay. I, I won't call you Jim, John or a, a June love or somebody. <laughs> sure, good morning. Good morning, uh, Chairman Jones, Board of Commissioners, staff, please pardon my uh, voice. Uh, I thought you were trying to do very wide. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> so, uh, okay. preparing, preparing to lose my voice a little okay. bit there. But uh, uh, since my arrival and since the last committee update, I feel we've had some uh, continued success in uh, meeting the expectations that have been uh, levied upon my uh, department and the programming committee. Through the programming committee, since we were just discussing parks and recs, um, we've uh, uh, commenced in having a new show, uh, executed two shows already, splossed, up to the minute updates, show updates. Uh, after the safety house uh, announcement for the fire department earlier, we uh, most recently, what's running now is a, a tape program from Boundary Waters Aquatic Center, promoting the um, what's happening there with people's money. So again, I apologize for my voice. Um, <clears throat> we've uh, tried to increase the, the production of the show quality that's been on here from the past uh, using the drone aerials within the program. If you haven't seen it, please, we encourage you to go to dctv23.com. Um, you can see you know, the latest with uh, the SPLAS program manager. Uh, Commissioner Mitchell is hosting the show and guests with uh, communications director of the SPLAS, David Good, as well. Um, in that show, we were able to promote uh, upcoming meetings, uh, uh, upcoming meetings regarding the building of the multipurpose center. We were able to provide that sort of promotion and publicity as well, and uh, which is coming up October 4th uh, at the Senior Center. In addition, uh, the programming committee uh, was able to produce a, another show called This is Douglas County. Uh, this is Douglas County, uh, is a brand new show promoting and showcasing Douglas County services. Douglas County services, the people who provide those services and the citizens they help. Uh, the first guest uh, was TJ Jaglinski, uh, the station manager for DCTV 23. Uh, it's a unique way to really learn what the communications and community relations department is doing. So those who have not seen it, we encourage you to uh, check that out as well. Um, through uh, programming, uh, the successes, we're trying to uh, uh, communicate, communicate, excuse me, uh, active things that are going on, uh, recent situations. Um, we're able to help the animal shelter services. Uh, Phoenix, if folks didn't hear, Phoenix was a, a dog left uh, starved and recovered. Uh, animal shelter services uh, needed some assistance and funding. So, you know, through programming, we were able to um, get funding and uh, thousands of dollars were donated uh, just, you know, as a result. So we were happy with that. 
uh, as I stand here looking at uh, <laughs> uh, Major uh, uh, Bobby Holmes, uh, the department was able to produce a um, recruitment video, a mm -hmm. recruitment video mm -hmm. uh, that uh, really saved citizens thousands of dollars because, again, we elevated the production value of the recruitment video. For example, when it was posted on Facebook, uh, in less than 24 hours, we're talking about 13,000 views already as a result, and it was a chance to really showcase uh, members of the sheriff's office who um, have been part of the department been part of the office and how they came along and, and so it was a really great uh, opportunity um, you know to, to 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 operate and that's you know going to be running on you know DC TV 23 as well to help uh, I think the reason my voice is gone is uh, <laughs> September Saturdays mm -hmm. September Saturdays mm -hmm. um, it, uh, you feel and based on the feedback that it was an incredible success uh, the last two Saturdays. I really want to thank uh, the Douglas County Fire Department and, and you know for being there in the sheriff's office and helping provide a really safe environment through you know the programming um, committee. We were really came together to execute that. Um, we had a couple first. Um, when I say first, first events, uh, Battle of the Bands. You know, two of the high school drum lines came and participated and that was the first time for them to participate so that was exciting for them uh, as well as on Heroes Day uh, we had a Factory Shoals uh, middle school pep band that had never participated and they were excited about that um, you know and what we've also executed um, uh, all things transportation a landing page mm -hmm. we're in the process of uh, building a landing page which exists um, to help with, you know, communicating transportation. What we've done was take Connect Douglas, which is already exists, and and uh, really help provide all information about transportation with the county within a recent year. We're updating minutes, agendas, and uh, you know we hope to have the page completed by the end of this week. And that's the end of my update, sir. Good, good, good. Well, I'll just add, though, again, on that landing page, the uh, all things transportation. Uh, kudos to uh, Vice Chair Robinson on, on kind of giving the, the, being the brain surgeon on that. But, uh, yeah, great job. And, and kudos to you, uh, Rick, on, on September Saturday. I think uh, I, I was highly impressed of how it ran, all the the layout and the professionalism and all that you guys did so kudos to your team and the job well done any questions on programming before we go into technology let's see. you ready my friend <laughs> so the technology community is just a barrel of monkeys <laughs> show up just laugh yeah, right. <laughs> um, so, you know, a number of things, there's a, there's a lot to catch up on, and I'm going to take advantage of the brevity offering, uh, offer. Um, we have looked at uh, several things that have come before the full board uh, recently. Electronic content management system that came before for our September records management 18. system uh, last weekend, right? Uh, or last, yeah, the last agenda. Um, don't want to take away from something, you know, Gary may share at some point, but uh, we just recently looked at uh, apparently CERTA is changing the way that they're um, they're going to be ticketing riders and we have a lot of people on express buses so uh, we were able to look into the options that CERTA is going to provide there, provide recommendations uh, as far as what we thought with the technology and I think that's moving forward at a, you know, a future point but we appreciate the opportunity to be able to um, give our opinions on that. Also recently um, the uh, DUI and, and drug courts were uh, they're very active uh, working with some people with great needs in our community. Uh, so we were looking at um, technology-based assessment tools for those guys to use uh, and being able to make sure they can give the care to uh, to people who are part of those accountability courts. Um, upcoming, uh, one of the things that we really want to focus on, and uh, so tomorrow we get to do a Cyber Awareness Month proclamation. We're excited about that. And also um, 
we're going to use the rest of this year to kind of look at our security posture from a cybersecurity perspective and try to make some changes and some improvements in that area. So that's what we got going on right now. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, outside of that, any questions on technology? And I'll just say from the intergovernmental, uh, those conversations from the mayor, myself, and others have uh, been going exceptionally well. Got a lot of things on the horizon. Um, and I think some have already I've seen come through that we've uh, had some great conversations. I think we're doing well on that from a governmental perspective. So outside of that, that's all my updates. I'll pass the torch on to finance, I guess. We're back to you now, Chief. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. We have transportation committee next. Uh, finance. Uh, finance. I'm sorry, I skipped the whole <laughs> finance committee. Uh, Commissioner okay. Robson, and then also you have transportation. I take both of them. Uh, Madam Director Holman, please. Yes. Uh, as far as the finance committee update, um, we have our um, municipal advisors, <coughs> David Corbin, still working on the tax abatement project um, to finalize that. I um, spoke with him this morning, actually, prior to this meeting. He's going to be, um, he has a meeting scheduled this afternoon with um, the development authority as well as the city develop development authority. Um, and he's going to drop by my office before that meeting and that's just kind of give me an update on, on how that's going. Um, I do know he's also, of course, reached out to our appraisal department, worked, um, has been working really close with uh, Benny and Sherry um, to develop some spreadsheets so that um, they can, after this project's complete and we have the results, they can continue on with the processes, the recommended processes and procedures um, that's going to be brought before you. Um, I think that was done a couple of weeks ago, and I, I think there's there's ten of them, but I think they're going back and making sure all the information that they're putting in each of those spreadsheets is correct. Um, so we have that going on. The capital plan or the long-term financial plan um, is still in its um, emphasis st st stages right now. Um, Shell worked really hard in um, developing, kind of, <coughs> kind of started from ground zero. We looked around what other counties were doing, and. Um, but we came up, or she came up with a form to uh, submit to all the departments for them to complete for each item that they uh, are, be, are going to be requesting for the next five years out. Uh, they submitted those back. Uh, she was able to take that information and uh, dump it into an Excel um, spreadsheet. So we have that raw data. Um, we provided it to Mark and during the budget hearings these past two weeks when we uh, briefly go over those with each department. Uh, if we had any questions or comments or any uh, concerns, uh, we would um, ask them at the budget hearing. Um, other than that, we're just trying along with the budget. Um, we do plan on, um, like I said, we had the two budget hearings, I mean two weeks of budget hearings. Um, we do plan on summarizing that these next couple of weeks and have some <coughs> that we can at least have general discussion with the finance committee as a whole on what the results are and, and how the budget's looking. Real quick, just for record, and um, County Clerk, now you can help us. So the Constitutional Officer Retreat is when? The 5th. It's Friday. The 5th, this Friday. Mm -hmm. And the Board of Commissioners Retreat is when? That is on the 14th and 15th, I believe. It's either 13th, 14th, or 14th, 15th. I think it's 14th and 15th. Of what month? November, I'm sorry. Okay, all right. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay. All right. I just want to clarify. That. Thank you yes. very much. All right. I think we're good. Any questions on that? Again, we're just going to continue on the process. That tax abatement is something that uh, we talked about at our board retreat um, as far as go for process. And so that's what we're focused on right now. And so we're just going to clarify on what that was. So I'll yield on that. Um, Director Valentin. Yes, sir. Transportation, quick update, and we'll keep it moving. Okay, as it relates to uh, the transportation elements, uh, actually I feel <coughs> like I gave a bit of an update yep. uh, a little earlier, but uh, <laughs> I will cover some of the projects that we didn't discuss earlier. Uh, I did mention that uh, the Stuart Mill and Yancey project now is back under construction. Uh, the delays uh, related to the right-of-way acquisition are behind us and they're moving forward. Stuart Mill and Reynolds is uh, in design and we're hoping to have that ready uh, to finalize that design and ready for bid by the end of 2019. Uh, the High Point Doris Road, Baker's Bridge, Sweetwater Road intersection, uh, the design is uh, 
essentially complete. We had an interagency agreement that was approved by the board uh, at the last meeting and uh, it is now being taken up by Poland County to, to move that along and then we're, we're in the preliminary elements of right-of-way acquisition on that project and that should be going uh, to construction, uh, advertised for construction at the end of this year uh, and construction starting in the spring. Whitestone culvert, the design is uh, essentially complete. There's some minor elements that we're having to uh, uh, to finalize there. Uh, in addition to uh, making sure that uh, that we have a project that is designed within our budget, uh, the right of way acquisition has been completed, and uh, actually that was that was a, a, a donation from. Uh, the, the property owner. So that element of it is out of the way. Uh, we're again finalizing the uh, the design and that'll be ready for advertisement uh, for construction in the spring, hopefully. Uh, Highway 5, the dual left turn lanes, uh, the right of way acquisition has been completed and the project has been submitted for certification for construction by the Georgia DOT. Maxim Road, we're finalizing the right-of-way acquisition, um, it, and it is to be certified for construction also by the end of the year uh, for advertising at the end of the year and construction in the spring. John West and Brightstar <coughs> were in preliminary right-of-way acquisition on that project. The design is essentially complete with uh, some minor tweaks, minor uh, elements that are related to the right-of-way acquisition element. Chapel Hill Road uh, widening, that project is under design. We've had a number of meetings with the design consultant uh, to um, provide direction and, and uh, address any questions that they might have had uh, related to the scope of the project. Uh, we also have the two new projects that were discussed earlier um, that will be getting underway in terms of uh, preliminary design. The Chapel Hill DDI and uh, the extension of uh, Lee Road. Um, there's also elements of, of um, transportation related to the FTA application for for the uh, fixed route bus service that uh, that is uh, underway. Um, negotiations with the third uh, party provider that will manage the operations are underway, and uh, we are continuing uh, the public outreach. Uh, both for the existing services and the proposed fixed route bus service. And uh, there will be, in connection with that application, there's two public hearings that will be coming up on October 16th and November 6th. And that's all I have. What are those last two dates again? October 16th and November 6th. And what are those for? Public hearings for the FTA application for the <coughs> fixed bus route service. That was a formal public, that's a formal public hearing. That is correct. Right. Just want to drive home that point just so that you, you didn't get lost in that. Thank you, Miguel. And, and I, I, again, um, I'm going to keep this moving along just for, for brevity's sake, but if you think about it, again, I'm, I'm going to go back to the finance and, and wrap this together about there's the current budget process, which is short term. And then there's this long-term capital plan process, and they're running in parallel. And I need everybody to be sensitive that they're two separate processes, but in both cases, there's limited dollars. And you're going to see that our, our, our narrative and our conversations with you all, the interaction has to change regarding priorities. And priorities shift based on who's ever at the table. Right? They shift. And I, I think it's, it, it only begets, that as, as I listen to this, I'm like, okay, but we, we still got limited dollars. What is our priorities of the moment? And I, I, again, this process, and Jennifer, I thank you so much for sort of driving this. It's an unsung hero. She doesn't get to speak that much, but I, I appreciate what you do in helping us um, lay a foundation for decision making forward because we're becoming more formalized. And I appreciate staff's commitment is not bureaucracy that we're putting in place, but it, we got to get a little bit more formal. Um, we're becoming a little bit more advanced as it relates to a county, uh, whereas in times past we could just make decisions and they were. It, they were appropriate at that time. Uh, we're held to a different standard now, and with that comes a, a higher standard for everybody. 
And so with that, I appreciate you guys' support regarding this new um, planning process. And I yield. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to the next three um, committees, which would be Benefits Committee. Benefits Committee. And Public Safety. Commissioner Moe here. All right. Uh, well, I, I covered this in the last uh, meeting, but it's important to cover it in this, uh, in this <coughs> venue as well. Uh, I chair the, uh, I should, more correctly, the Employee Benefits Committee. So it's the county employees. And uh, we went through a review process, looked at some new uh, uh, medical uh, providers. Uh, the committee unanimously elected to stay with uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shield, but it uh, behooves us to, every several years, there's like an internal auditor, uh, send some feelers out, see if there's a, a better program, a more effective program, a more inexpensive program out there. And we've done that and elected to stay with Blue Cross and Blue Shield uh, for this next year. Uh, having said that, uh, there was uh, there were no changes in terms of uh, uh, deductibles and co-pays or coverages and that sort of thing, with one small exception, and that has to do with the, the change in the uh, uh, short-term and long-term uh, disability uh, deductible, as I, as I recall. That was the only, only change. Um, another thing, the trend that we're seeing is that uh, due to changes that have taken place in, in, in the program over the last several years, our posture is looking better uh, in terms of our uh, benefit uh, deficit or benefit liability. And I'm going to ask Jennifer to touch on that. Sure. Um, as you know, we cumulatively have um, built up a deficit over the past several years, and we ended last year with about a $3.5 million deficit in the health care fund. Uh, when we, uh, when our new external auditors came in and looked at that deficit, they wanted us to, and it came before y'all, um, to adopt a formal three-year plan to uh, eliminate that deficit, um, starting with 2018. 2018, we were able to uh, look at our budgeted funds, um, as well as a contribution from the workers' comp fund, because it had a healthy fund, positive fund balance, and make the contribution for this year uh, into that um, health care fund to um, reduce it. Um, for 2018, right now as it stands, claims are about 10% less, 10 to 12% less than what we actually budgeted for um, in 2018. So any surplus that we have this year in the fund will go directly toward that deficit. So we hope that um, that contribution along with the one that we had prior uh, made earlier this year will help um, eliminate it all or at least it will be a very small deficit going into the 2019 budget and it may be something that we just um, can eliminate in two years instead of three we just have to see how the numbers shake out thank you very much mm -hmm. um, pension advisory board I'm, I'm just going to turn this entirely over to over to Jennifer sure mm -hmm. uh, good news with the pension um, as you know, last year we had to make a substantial increase in our pension contribution due to um, benefit changes, but more importantly, the actuarial changes. Um, we had to make what they call the recommended contribution instead of um, the required contribution. Uh, the required is the, the minimum you have to make. The recommended is if you don't meet certain milestones, then you have to make the recommended. We made that last year. We had to make an additional two, an additional two million dollar uh, contribution for 2018. We received our actuarial report, and um, we um, the recommended contribution amount is 5.5 million. And we do have the budget funds in this year to go ahead and make the recommended contribution, even though that the required is a little bit less. Uh, we feel with, um, we've been told by, um, with meeting with GEPCOR that there are some actuarial changes, you never say that word, changes that are going to be occurring in um, the next couple of years. You've heard me say, uh, which is actually true, but the, there, one of the changes is that government employees tend to live longer. So the mortality rate uh, table is going to change, um, show, reflecting that. And if you live longer, then your liability is bigger. Um, so uh, we do feel like it's important, you know, to have that 5.5. Go ahead and make that recommended contribution, so they're not we're not coming back before you next year, like we did last year, and say, hey, there's two million dollars that we have to do 
um, make a contribution. So the fund is healthy. Um, we've been working with ACC, uh, GEP G and GEP Corps to make sure that we're in line with what their policies um, are. But the pension fund is is healthy and stable. And kind of wrap an envelope around those two items, the uh, Benefit Committee and the Pension Advisory Board. These are things that you, you uh, if there are deficiencies and liabilities and, and just issues and so forth, uh, usually they're not things that you can uh, fix in, in one year. Right. Uh, it takes a period of time. And, and that, that's what this board is, has addressed, this, this uh, board of commissioners as well as these uh, two uh, employee boards have addressed over a period of time. And that's uh, largely in part uh, the decisions made then. Uh, have brought these uh, these two boards into a much healthier and these two funds into a much uh, much healthier posture, and uh, so I'm very very proud of their work in doing that. Uh, the last report I have is the Public Safety Board, and uh, again we kind of touched this, but this is for the, this uh, kind of a new group here. Uh, I can't. It's so long ago. I can't remember the date. When was our uh, uh, active shooter? Uh, July 25th. July 25th. Okay. What a, what a great event. Uh, over 350 volunteers uh, working in that. Multiple agencies, I'm not going to go through and, and name them, but just you can name one and they, and they were probably there, all the way up to including uh, the uh, state uh, entity, uh, GEMA. Uh, so it was a great learning experience. Some uh, training materials will be derived uh, from uh, videos and some of the things that we learned through the active shooter process. Um, it was it was a wonderful, fulfilling event, and uh, and our, all of our public safety entities, uh, local and actually a couple out of county, uh, contributed greatly to that. With that, I'm going to turn it over to, to uh, Bobby Holmes, and uh, he's got some other updates for us. Um, as y'all aware about the, the, the July 25th active shooter thing, one of the targeted things we were trying to do was we got it out to our local uh, elected officials as well as on the state level, legislators, and also try to target the state school board to, to, to be there to see this. Um, as a result of that, Matt Kroll, our solicitor general, is on the state school board. Um, and uh, there was somebody else, I can't recall his name, that was out there during the training. As a result, we were invited last Thursday to the state school board downtown uh, to do a presentation. Myself, Lieutenant Elmer Horn, and Sergeant Jesse Hamrick went down there. Jesse Hamrick did the presentation, and basically, in a nutshell, it had to do, our, our, kind of our goal was that there's been, for decades, there's been fire drills and fire training and weather training and, and, and very few deaths that resulted in that. Obviously, with our active shooter stuff across the nation, that's kind of probably the biggest <coughs> fear that we have. And what we were able to do was Jesse talked about the historical stuff, talked about Christ training and what we were doing and what we did with our operation. And uh, it was a huge hit with the state school board. Um, they were very, very appreciative and very, very um, questioned us a lot afterwards about it. Matter of fact, Jesse's going back to the November 8th meeting as it is tentatively going to teach the two-hour Christ training, which Christ is citizen response to active shooter events. Um, if y'all have never heard Jesse speak um, or have never heard him train, he is phenomenal. He, he captivated, I'll say that, the school board. I sat there and we watched it. Um, and uh, they know, I talked to the uh, chairman afterwards. Normally, they limit their presentations to 20 minutes. At that point, they'll give somebody the hook. Jesse spoke for over an hour. Oh, wow. That's great. And so it was a huge success. So I agree, Commissioner, as a result of our training was a big success. We've reached out and now we have touched the state school board, who is the one who oversees everything. And hopefully we can maybe get some thought process going about something down the road training-wise uh, in, in some sort of active shooter or something across the state. So I just want to make sure everybody knows that. Bravo. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Very good. Thank you. Finish? Mm -hmm. And last but not least, we have the safety board. We are doing a lot of great things as uh, the chair of that board. We are um, doing magnificent things. We've just recently approved the safety manual. And then also before I just kind of let the cat out the bag, I wanted my director of risk and safety to come forward. Uh, Mr. Matt Laverne just shared the things that we've done. 
Yes, ma'am. Um, and thank you, Madam Chairman, and good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, the uh, the Safety Board continues to uh, to have many successes and has reviewed 58 different uh, motor vehicle accidents since uh, the last time we met on March 19th. Um, uh, in addition to reviewing those 58 uh, incidents, um, the Safety uh, Board has made two recommendations, uh, one being ice cleats and the other being the manual. The safety manual we brought to the Board um, um, a, a few work sessions ago and it was approved uh, by this Board. Now we're doing the hard work of getting polishing it up and getting it ready to be online um, per Mr. Till's instructions, we were trying to get it on the uh, water cooler as soon as possible. Um, I had my long-term plan in risk and safety had put me on uh, early January with the implementation, but we have been close to being, being ready anyway, so I believe we're still going to be able to. Uh, so now our goal is by the end of October, we're going to have all of this on the water cooler as well as risk and safety's website because this the safety manual uh refers to 24 different forms and 44 different safety classes that are available to employees so we most certainly don't want to to just get the manual up without getting everything else up on it first uh, so that everything works and can provide um all of these uh all of the reporting forms as well as course definitions uh, course scheduling. Um, we're also uh, completing and finalizing some vehicle inspection forms. Um, and then we're also uh, on the web, on Risk and Safety's uh, webpage. Of course, we'll have the agendas, the schedules, the definitions, the bylaws. Um, so we're currently working this week on, uh, on defining all those 44 classes and, uh, and polishing those definitions. Um, we have also, um, again, I was um, I was very grateful to uh, the board of Com or uh, to uh, the safety board for approving the ice cleats. These things are used now in the south. You don't see it as as often or frequently in local governments as you do, especially in transit systems uh, from Michigan to, to Colorado. Um, and ice cleats are kind of similar to golf cleats. Um, and they reduce slips and falls by 90%, okay, because most slips and falls come from the hills coming out from underneath you. I had once spoken about eight years ago with a gentleman that's with us here today about some ice cleats that he had designed himself, um, and these are similar to them, but these are a lighter weight that, that, um, that can be worn by any shoe except what's called a skeletto. Um, and those are high heels. Um, but the ice cleats look like this, okay? And they fit on fire boots, public safety tactical boots, a variety of different things, uh, or footwear. For the price of these, um, for our last uh, injury that we had from a slip and fall, we could have bought 4,000 pairs of them. So we're going to buy 340 pairs and outfit our public safety as well as all operational support <coughs> departments to those from DOT to, of course, EMAs and uh, E911, a variety of different departments. But uh, uh, Mr. Till uh, uh, graciously uh, offered his assistance to help us go ahead and get moving on those on both of these items. So. Um, that is where we are, and we're just continuing to follow our protocols and uh, work through our agendas and uh, um, trying to meet our goals of making Douglas County and its workforce uh, safer day by day. Okay. Thank you so much. And I stand to be corrected. We have one more presentation, and we always say the best for last, which is fire and this. And I, <laughs> and I, I apologize, uh, Commissioner Guy, to my eyes. I, I had a birthday suit recently, so I need to check my reading glasses, and I missed it. So, fire and EMS committee, uh, Commissioner Guy. And the eyes on the downhill from me. That's what I'm saying. I said, I missed it. Um, throughout the years, uh, the fire department being a, a very huge portion of the workforce of Douglas County, uh, as it is in other counties, uh, if there was a 
shortage in revenues, that department seemed to be cut, uh, especially when it came to personnel because they had the largest number of personnel. And so it fell up under the uh, county commissioners. So throughout the years, we've accumulated way too many open uh, positions. And uh, the fire and EMS committee has been addressing this. Uh, of course, you can't undo years of uh, pushing the can down the road. Uh, you can't undo it in one year. So uh, we, we took a bite out of it. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning of this year, we were about 20, 24 uh, positions short uh, for firefighters. And as of today, we're 15 short. So we, we have taken a bite out of that. We're paying far though than those nine uh, that are still in school with the overtime. Uh, we offset some of uh, the required overtime because of us being so short in personnel. So um, we're making a, a, a headway. Uh, we're, we're slowly but surely uh, addressing that shortage. And 15 is uh, a smaller number that we have to uh, look at for next year than the 24 was last year, of course. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, we've had several recommendations that came through our committee, and I'm going to turn it over to the chief to let him uh, to recap that. Well, thank you, Commissioner Guider. Uh, the, the other members of our committee are Commissioner Mulcair, of course, County Manager Mark mm -hmm. Till, myself, and Deputy Chief Scott Sackmeyer. We've had six recommendations, uh, and they are to award the bid to Titus Construction to renovate our fire station number three down on Kilroy Lane. Uh, the notice to proceed was given uh, last week, so they are in the process of starting work on that station. Uh, one of the recommendations made was to purchase seven Lucas devices, and basically what a Lucas device is, is an automatic chest decompressor. So instead of somebody having to push on somebody's chest doing CPR, there's a mechanical device that does that. We have not purchased those yet. Uh, we're actually doing some research. Uh, we talked to our medical director uh, to find out what the best unit out there is, so we're still in the process of getting all that together. Uh, the purchase of our turnout gear, it was approved uh, a couple of commission meetings ago. Uh, that has been ordered. Uh, we expect it to be here probably around Thanksgiving. Uh, they came out and test fitted all of our personnel. Uh, we've got a, uh, a sample set in hand and uh, we made some very minor changes uh, at no additional cost, by the way, and uh, they should be here by Thanksgiving. We bought a fire truck since the last meeting. Uh, the PO's been issued for that. We've also awarded a bid to William Scottman for uh, temporary housing while we're doing the renovation at Fire Station 3. Uh, we're waiting on one more signature uh, for that, and then that'll be in process. And we adopted change order number two for the radio system. Uh, that was done uh, several meetings ago. And then the rest is uh, just our splashed equipment that's been purchased. Uh, we've got the pumper truck that'll be delivered in 45 to 60 days. Two ambulances, we should take delivery of those by the end of October. Three staff vehicles that were ordered, we've already taken delivery of two, and the other one should be in by the end of October. Uh, and then the rest is the radio system, uh, which is by far the biggest project uh, we've ever undertaken. But uh, with today's vote on the property, we only like one site, uh, and we'll have all of our sites that we need to uh, make the system work. Uh, with the sites we already have, uh, which is Fire Station 5, Chapel Hill, Bellark Park, the foundations for those towers are already in. The towers will be constructed uh, this month. The foundation work and tower constructions at Fire Station 8, which is Mirror Lake, and Fire Station 11, which is on 92 North. Mm -hmm. uh, those are in progress. 
the Fulton County Fire Station 13, we had to tear an old tower down. Uh, that's been completed, so we're good to go there. And we did a subscriber demonstration last week, so we'll actually, we've actually put our hands on the radios we'll be getting. Uh, had several users there, uh, so we're, we're moving forward there. We have an inspection of our mock alert system for the fire stations scheduled for October 24th through the 26th. And then in December, we have an inspection and testing of our of the entire radio system. So that's where we're at. We're still uh, we're a little bit behind schedule uh, due to the land acquisition. Uh, so originally it was going to be September of next year. It's, it'll probably be a month or so later, according to Motorola. But we're also under budget. Yes, ma'am. And uh, we saved a lot of tax dollars, uh, and there's squash tax dollars, I guess, on the turnout gear by pig piggybacking mm -hmm. Fulton, yes, Fulton County. We're, we're, we're always looking for ways to, to, to save money. Uh, and uh, we also hired a new fire marshal, our fire marshal of 33-plus uh, years retired Friday, uh, Scott Bishop. Mm -hmm. uh, we've hired a new one, and I'll introduce him tomorrow at the meeting. And uh, through a couple of grants uh, between uh, uh, Keep Douglasville Beautiful and Keep Douglas County Beautiful, we have a uh, total of about 56,000 nine-volt batteries uh, for smoke detectors that we're handing out. Uh, we did a made a dent in it on uh, September Saturdays the last two weeks but uh, we're still continuing to do that. And what everybody always is happy about, the burn ban went off yesterday, so you can burn yard debris now. However, you must have a permit and weather conditions must be favorable. All right, and just um, a little uh, tidbit about the uh, new hires, the nine employees they're still in school they have to be in school for another 12 months no, well the, they'll be in school uh their emt school for another month or so uh and then they'll be on the ambulances and then we'll send them to fire school at some point within the next two years okay. to get them cross trained as fire all right but it'll give them uh especially the captains in the different uh stations a lot of relief yes they don't have to call around and <laughs> try to Fill up the trucks. So. Yes, ma'am. Uh, anyway, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Great presentation. I would like to personally thank all the committees uh, and uh, so and all the teams for doing such a great job. You have made a significant amount of progress in the last six months, and as evident by your reports today, and look forward to our future reports in uh, three months. But we are definitely moving the county forward, and I really appreciate all the hard work. Uh, next, we'll move to move to tab number 20, which is uh, blighted communities and pipe farms. Um, this administration, as I mentioned earlier in our, well, this year in, in April, that we wanted to, uh, be, uh, part of the initiative was to not build new, but to look at what's out here existing, because we have a lot of pipe farms that are out here that are remaining, uh, remaining from the recession, and we wanted to just look at, look at that first before we continue to just build new uh, subdivisions. But with that being said, um, I had a team together, it was our director, if he's here, our director of to, to pull some information together for me regarding, uh, we took, took a look at the unplatted and non-platted, the ones that are platted and non-platted uh, vacant lots that are out there. And, um, and as this discussion go for, forward, I would like uh, Commissioner Robinson to leave it, our vice chairman who I assigned this project to and ask him, ask him if we could take a look at it and see what we could do to resurrect uh, these dead spaces and see what we can do to move this project forward. So, sure. Director Worthington, if you could just give us a... Good afternoon, history. everyone. Good afternoon. <laughs> you just, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I'll, at the pleasure of the board, we can go any direction y'all wish with this, but um, just a little background, as everybody knows, uh, Douglas County. Director. Sure. You just want to frame it. Yeah, this is important, um, just, just for the public. Uh, this is an actual policy discussion. Right. And so this is just the initial phase of that. Um, there won't necessarily be any action taken by the board commissioners here. It is just to hear 
um, our current lay of the land um, by our directors that may come forth. But if the, the end goal may be a policy either um, taken on the board commissioners or recommendation to some other agency, but for the most part, um, this is the first step of a public meeting. And that's important for the press when they need to recognize that, that if there is going to be some action, this is the beginning of that. So I yield. There you go. So uh, as I was saying, there's, as everybody's aware, Douglas County suffered pretty bad during a recession, I'll just just recession, I guess, but uh, there are a number of lots out there that are vacant, that are platted. Um, we had staff go through and, and figure out how many are out there. Um, we've got about 1,200 lots remaining that are in platted subdivisions um, that are, some of which are partially built out, some are not built out at all, totally vacant. Um, we have a number of subdivisions that are vacant, that were not platted or not quite to the point to be built in, <clears throat> that some regulation changes um, from the Water and Sewer Authority are affecting. Those, those are kind of slowing things down on nine subdivisions in the county. Um, we got together, we've, we've discussed this with uh, at the Development Authority with a number of staff members, a number of uh, other uh, people in the community, representatives, and some of those are here today, so I'll point those out so if, as we go forward, y'all can ask them questions as needed. I'll start with Chris Bonfries, Development Authority Director. Um, Chris Collier, representing the Home Builders Association. Um, Leslie Chu, he's a builder developer, long time around Douglas County. Kyle Gable, um, we had a few others that have left that were involved in some of the meetings. Uh, we also got uh, Travis McDonald, he's an uh, assistant county engineer that had compiled a lot of this data. Um, and Daryl Ray can speak on some of this also. He's here. I'm not sure if you're here for this, but uh, you can speak on this too. He's heavily involved in development of Douglas County in general. They do a lot of stuff with use Ray. So. Um, Mark Peel has been involved in it some as well. So I'll go with this however y'all wish. I'm, I'm not sure the direction here, so. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. All right, so again, for the sake of this conversation, um, I, I'd like to, the question becomes, um, for the Board of Commissioners only, should we take any action to incent the development of these areas? Um, the concern is you've got blight um, that's, in, um, that's currently out there. And I need the public to hear this um, in, in the press as well, is, is it's not could the Board of Commissioners do something, but should we do this? And, and what, what struck me is we've got, think about the foreclosures that occurred um, during the Great Recession. Um, and think about when we came out of that and you heard um, our public say, uh, we got phone calls, says, well, what are y'all going to do about this foreclosed property next door? Y'all need to do something about this. And we're like, well, the banks own that. And the public was like, well, still, you need to do something about that. Go out there and cut the grass. Go out there and do this. Get rid of the rattlesnakes and all this, right? So think about a house of one and how much, I won't listen, it was just concern. Uh, now multiply that by how many? There's about 1,200 vacant lots 1200. that were planted in the last two decades. And, and I'm going to give you context. If, if one house, a house of one concerned us, uh, the, the concern is that we've got this blind communities. Now, people may say, well, let, let the market take over. Listen, because I'm going to ask the, uh, our, our industry friends to weigh in. Let the market handle it. Let, let, let them absorb this and stuff, right? And, and so, okay, we can sit here. But I need you to think about this, and this is for, for the Board of Commission, this is our, 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 our public debate, which is, okay, if we do nothing, and this has been sitting here for 10 years, and I, I don't know what the developer's position is. They can walk, go through it, go around it, whatever the case may be. But my concern is, if we do nothing, you've got a pre-existing condition. And how will that affect the current value of the houses around it? Not could we do something. We're very clear on, our, on, on what the Board of Commissioners can and can't do. It's should we do something. And so just like with foreclosures, do we get involved, do we work with the banks, do we, do we get involved and work with the developers, is, do we get involved with other agencies that may have some prohibitive or some, some constraining issues 
The question is, should we do it? Because we're trying to move forward. If we do nothing, these communities will sit there, and I'll use Palmer Falls as an example. You'll have, you know, things will grow up around it, snakes and turtles and, and, and trees and so forth. But I'm not saying it, it, it's going to happen. Uh, but the question is, um, should the Board of Commissioners take action? And that's what we're here to sort of hear from the public, hear from staff, hear from industry um, uh, professionals to say, okay, guys, this is your chance. You need to say something right now uh, to give us um, a reason why we should get involved. So we're not trying to sell this to anyone. We're trying to hear. So we're, we're engaging the public to say, okay, this has come before us. We foresee there's going to be an issue here. Um, just by way that uh, we plan to take this to the public um, and some of our outreaches um, with the commissioners are going to ask the public themselves But this is a chance for some of the professionals to get involved. So um, Director Worthington, to give Chris Pumphrey. Can you? Chris yeah. can you come forward and just just We want to hear from you guys. So we're not pitching. We're listening Good afternoon everybody Good afternoon. Uh, So yes, sir, we um, you know, historically, we pretty much just focus on commercial industrial development and recruitment here to the community. Um, one of the things that is very important in what we do is being able to tell the story of the community and be able to showcase progress. And uh, whereas we don't do housing, when the, there is a lack of progress on the housing front, it brings about questions. <coughs> you know, about what truly is happening in the marketplace. And so, you know, we've um, had a number of discussions um, you know, in, in, in regards to development as a whole, you know, looking at all the different master plans we've been involved in, the Sweetwater plan, what's happening on the Lee Road corridor, and the North Side master plan. There's a lot of that, you know, is touching on um, the mixture of commercial and residential development. So we've had a number of discussions, um, myself and Chris Collier and Leslie and Kyle, on a number of different fronts, whether those be challenges that they have faced um, in doing business or as we look at you know, what truly should be the outlook on how we get some of these platted lots um, developed, um, you know, we, have, we have those discussions. And so I, I think it's very important that that the Board of Commissioners is taking this topic up. Um, and, and, you know, to your point, you know, should something be done? Um, I would say probably so. We just need to figure out what that something is. And I think there's a number of directions that we could probably take uh, in that regard. One of the things that we're very concerned about is ensuring that the process for the development community is something that is very clear that we provide clear direction on what's required, how long it's going to take, how much it's going to cost, so that they can build that into their schedules. What we, what we don't want to be is the community that throws up a bunch of hurdles in order to get development done, and that's across the board. And so that definitely affects housing. And I've even had conversations with some developers who say they've had experiences doing trying to you know, develop, you know, residential development here, and it had challenges. And so how do we overcome those challenges? Okay. Um, it, it, uh, um, and again, we're not going to go deep. We want to keep this broad right now, Chris. And James, either one you can answer. Are we, ex are we experiencing challenges? And again, I do appreciate that we've got this new image where we're saying, come do business with Douglas, and they get in here, and it's like, well, it hasn't, you know, we don't see the change. Um, is it something that's within our development? I mean, uh, if you think about the development process, there's a lot of different agencies, a lot of different people involved in sort of the checkoff, right? It's not all county, uh, even though, you know, we're county proper. Um, what are we hearing? What are we experiencing? I, I need you guys, I mean, where is the stoppage occurring? Where, where are you hearing the, you know, from the community? What's happening? So, when we started our discussions, it was it was real broad, like you just said. You know, hey, what can we do to to spur some interest back here, get things rolling again? Um, and there didn't seem to be any singular hurdle that we could, you know, hey, if we change this, everything's great again. Um, it was there's some little bumps and things along the way, but um, obviously, just the the market is a, a huge part of it. There's some, some bumps 
and things that we can iron out on our end um, that are small, um, and, and we're looking into a few things now. Um, there are other uh, entities, water and sewer, um, there are state laws that involve uh, stormwater, water quality and things. Those combined are kind of an issue together. Some affect certain subdivisions, some affect others, some affect all, some affect none. It's, it's not a singular case that we can just say, if we change this, everything's great. So we kind of went down that road like, well, what, what can we do? And we started looking at um, maybe incentivizing based off of uh, some way to do uh, various levels of quality rather than size. You know, can we enforce a certain standard of construction? Um, that brings a lot of its own hurdles of how we would actually enforce that because what I think is wonderful construction you may disagree with or they may disagree with. So it's got to be something we can codify in a way that, that we can enforce. Um, we looked at um, green, like Earthcraft homes. I talked to some, some people about Earthcraft and some different options that, that way. So we're, we're kind of feeling out in different directions. But I don't think we've, we've seen this one aha moment that this is what we need to fix. Um, would anybody agree or disagree with that? I mean, I don't know if we've... Uh, yeah, let, 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 and I thank you for that. So let me, let, let's keep this going. We're going to be very sensitive time. Uh, Madam Chair, if, if you permit, yes. I'd like to bring some of the industry, anybody, um, you didn't necessarily have to sign up to speak at this moment, but if anybody wanted to come to the podium now and just weigh in, you get three minutes or so just to sort of give us some insight. Um, just go for it. We need to hear from you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Matthew Smoot, and I'm the, uh, the okay. owner of a property called Legacy Park. Um, okay. Well, the, uh, the vacant land, we have 72 lots that we can't build on. And the stoppage has been um, that these were built, it was built as a private road with private infrastructure. Uh, private uh, sewer, water, and storm water. And uh, so our stoppage has been when we, when we got to the Water Sewer Authority, the Water Sewer Authority um, <coughs> says that we have, to, we have to change out everything because they didn't inspect it when, because it was a private road. Um, and, and the cost to go in there and to trade out the, the sewer that's already been put in to, to change out the water that's already been put in and uh, the storm water um, is over a million bucks and so we're uh, the, the economics just does, doesn't work um, we, we've been under contract with a, uh, a home builder they wanted to, to build some some nice new homes um, and they've walked away uh, so we're you know we're, we're frustrated and we hope that there can be a solution we we uh, offered we don't we offered to put up a, a bond, you know, a post post performance bond, you know, if there was any break in the line, we said we could we could put a camera um, through the sewer to see if there's any breaks with the line. The upper portion of this same line um, has been built and existing, and people have been using it for 12 years now since 2006. There's 12 units. And we haven't had any issues there. Excuse me, just for everybody's uh, edification, talk about your location. Where, where, where's your site? Uh, we're where? off of Old Lee Road. Um, it's uh, just north of the Publix. Yeah, just north. Thank you. Just north of the Publix. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So it was, it was 84 lots in the beginning, and 12 were built on. And so we're down to the, the 72. But. I mean, inside of that community, we, I mean, you need scale to make things work. With only 12 lots, I mean, it's hard to run a, a, the HOA with, with only 12 people paying in. We really can't open our pool and justify having a pool there. Um, there's, there's a lot of things we'd like to do we can't do because we're sitting on these vacant lots and, and we're just stuck there. You know? um, and like I said, we've, we've tried to broker a, some sort of compromise. Can we put up a bond? We do something, um, 
we don't see the risk because the 12 units there haven't had an issue. You know, uh, but uh, that's that's where we're at. Okay. Yeah, you're, and, and again, we are, because there is multiple um, uh, topics, I'm going to just focus here just for a minute. Uh, James, are you familiar with this performance bond that was put up? Uh, well, yes, sir, but this is the water and sewer is all part of the water and sewer I understand, authority. but you're aware of what this is. I, I'm aware they've been working with them trying to resolve it, but we're not involved in that resolution. All right, just make a note of that. Okay, Mr. Smoots, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Well, for now. Is there anybody else who want to speak? Again, this is for our industry players to come on up. Come on, partner. I'd like to. Right. Uh, I'm going to switch hats. So I'm going to talk owner, but I also want to talk broker. So I'm Kyle Gable, Pioneer Land Group. Um, I've closed over 5,500 developed lots in Atlanta over the last five years. I do stuff in Gwinnett, uh, you know, Henry County, everywhere. Everywhere he has new development, except Douglas County. Douglas County right now, and I'll be happy to sit down with you, James, and, and uh, talk about the lots. I'm showing, and this is through Metro Study, there's 3,000 developed lots in Douglas County. Under our current starts, there is an 86-month supply of lots in our county, seven years. If you take, uh, and I'll, I've got a report here, I'll leave, and I'll be happy to sit down with this Metro Studies Premier Housing so, uh, Service in Atlanta. If you take Paulding County, they've got double the number of lots at 5,900 and their supplies at 44 months. We've got an issue, and so that's kind of in general, but I want to talk, I've kind of got a similar issue as him, so I bought a little subdivision off Old Beulah Road uh, that was developed but not final platted. I'm also here on uh, behalf of the owner of Palmer Falls. They've got the same issue, and then Holly Springs, I think, Mike, you've talked to Brent Shearer, they've got that same deal, so it was developed but not final platted. Um, I purchased my subdivision in 2016. We had an email from the WSA saying that nothing had to be done. You need to inspect it, put up a bond. Um, we ended up submitting in our plans back in uh, June of last year. WSA said no pipe replacement. We resubmitted again back in October. They come back after we submitted our plans and said, you've got to replace the pipe in the dam. Well, I ended up uh, making a petition to the board uh, back in April and they they denied it and we got our contractor out there and they turned around and said hey You've got to replace all the pipe. So it went from none to 80 to 650 that cost went from none from 10 to 35,000 uh, The Holly Springs, I think there's as close to 250,000 and so You know when you start talking that that's a I mean, I've got a builder. I'm under contract but I'm not going to spend that money right now because it's, you know, it's going to put me in a hole. These other subdivisions, builders can go in there. Palmer Falls, I know it. I'm their broker. Holly Springs, they want to build it out their self. But when you start throwing those types of fees on, um, and especially you know, um, when WSA has approved, I know of at least two subdivisions. One of them, perennial wall. It's referenced in my email. They said we made a mistake. Well, I went to the after making the petition to the board. I went three different meetings. I brought up another subdivision that was approved and as built signed off on in December 2017. Same exact time of my plans were sitting in the office of the WSA. Theirs was approved, no pipe replacement. Mine, you got to replace also all of it. So I, that's kind of, you know, when you're hitting hurdles like that, there's a reason Douglas County is the second worst county in all of Metro Atlanta. And I've got the numbers right here, and I'll be happy to sit down with James and put it, put them together, and just show that. So, but like I said, mine's you know the WSA issue, and I've got that, and can give that if that's needed. Okay. It, it, you bring, thank you. <coughs> it, you. You bring up the point of I remember at the time we used to be number one in foreclosures and number one in distress sales in the state. But we were the last to be built out, and so we really we boomed there for a minute. And it sounds like we put some new standards in place during the recession. And I, I guess my question is, um, those standards for new development keeps going. I mean, in other words, that, that was appropriate. But you had these pre-existing, and I, I think about grandfather clauses when we put policies in place that says, okay, but did we anticipate what this would mean down the road? Which is why sometimes, you know, just like the U.S. Constitution, anything else can be amended. I, and I guess this is where I want to make sure we're, we're just not having a conversation is that, okay, is there a specific policy that we need to go after to sort of make an amendment to? 
uh, to adjust. And it's okay. It's not to say that it was supposed to be perfect out the gate, uh, whether it's here with the Board of Commissioners or if it's with another agency like WSA where we can make a res uh, pass a resolution to make a recommendation for a change. I, I, I just want to be very specific about what we're looking at now. So I just want to make that comment. Let's keep this going. Is there anybody else yeah, that wants yeah. to speak? No. Yeah, I'd like to speak. My name is Chris Collier. I'm the executive officer for the Home Builders Association. I hear these stories all the time from all of our members, basically. Uh, I'd like to tell you a story first. I grew up in North Alabama. I lived 15 years in Florence, Alabama, across the river from Florence, Alabama, this Muscle Shoals. In the mid-1940s, Muscle Shoals found out that Ford Motor Company was fixing to move to Muscle Shoals. They went out in the country and developed hundreds of acres with curbs and gutters and streets and water, and Ford never came. Until this day, they're raising cotton in 50 foot by 200 foot lots. <laughs> and it's easy to get the tractors in because they just drive down to the corner and turn left. Right. But they were never able to recover. Mm -hmm. One reason they were never able to recover was they had the wrong type lots in place. They had 50 foot lots. And that's what had proved and that's what had been put in place. And so as a result of that, you know, you also need to be able to look at a subdivision, what the current specifications are and what the current codes are on that, that requirement-wise on that subdivision. Because a lot of the subdivisions and a lot of the lots in Douglas County are based on building homes that are going to cost $355,000 or more. That would be the cost of selling it, not of building it. Douglas County is not a $350,000 base house price community. We don't have the restaurants, we don't have the, uh, the uh, uh, shopping areas and whatnot to support people who live in 350 to half million dollar homes. So we've got a challenge in that area. This project is so much bigger than just, gosh, how do we get people to build on these lots? First of all, we're not even building where there are no lots restrictions. You want to build a house out here and you're a regular builder, you run into the same type of obstacles that he just discussed. You also run into the same type of obstacles of we've got buyers who are looking to buy in a particular price range and building requirements that don't meet that price range. And it's something that needs to be talked about. When you look at the major large national builders who come into Douglas County and are building, they're building on lots that they picked up at very, very reasonable price from the local banks. And as a result of that, they are able to build a, uh, an affordable home. The problem that we uh, have and experience with that is a typical local builder cannot buy 20 lots at a time, cannot build and compete with the national builders who are here. And one of the reasons they can't build is because the banks will not loan any money. That's one group of individuals missing from this room today, the bankers. If we can't get loans to build houses, no matter what the subdivision existing is, situation is, we need the banks to join into this. And right now, I'll give you a good example. Home Builders Association, Douglas County, zero banker millers this year, last year. For the last 10 years, zero bankers want to even come to the meetings and have conversations with us. Why? Because they don't see this as a good market for them to be making an investment in. So a person who wants to build a spec home on a subdivision lot that's already in place can't do that even if he wants to unless he builds it out of his own pocket. And there are not a lot of builders left after the last 10 years that have got enough money in their pockets to build a home from scratch by themselves. Uh, I could probably go on for quite some time, but I don't want to bore you all. The problem is bigger than do we get involved or do we not get involved? Of course you get involved. You're our local community government. You're the people who have the responsibility for looking at the problems that we're facing, bringing the people to the table to try and find a solution. So <clears throat> what you're doing, I commend you for it. It's the first time in my 19 years as executive officer for this association here in Douglas County that I've actually seen support come out of this room. And I hope that it doesn't just die at the end of today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anybody else? 
Yeah, but it's your um, good afternoon. Um, Chris alluded to a couple things, and I'm probably uh, fortunate enough to be in the minority. I've built four houses in the last 18 months. They range anywhere from 1.7 million to 900,000. Now that is not the norm in this community. One of the things the customers that I, clients that I build houses for, they have a lot of equity, three, four, five, six hundred thousand. But when you put that much money into your home and you have a hard time getting the appraisal to be equivalent to the loan amount, that's a little bit disheartening. And that is one of the biggest issues we face in Douglas County right now. If you build a nice home, your client better have a lot of cash because you're not going to get the appraisal to support the sales price. Like Chris, being involved in this association and being on development authorities and wearing the Habitat for Humanity hat and being uh, a participant in the NSP program that I commend the county, uh, we actually started a new home today off of Shallowford Way. Uh, I'm a sponge. People call me. I don't have all the answers. But because I'm involved, they ask me, you know, what do you think about this? What can we do? And I live here, by the way, and I'm not going anywhere. There are a lot of people that are hightailing it out of Douglas County for whatever reason, but you're never going to outrun the reasons that people are leaving. I'm here to make this a better community, and I want this to be a better community. I'm one of the few builders who advocates quality. Years ago, we sat in county commission meetings and we spent a lot of time up here as an association when Mr. Molkier was with Friends of Douglas County not supporting minimum square footages, not buying into the concept that if you brick a house four sides, it's quality. That doesn't mean anything. Truly put, guidelines, procedures in place where quality can be done in a 2,000 square foot house. When I was younger, 30, when I couldn't afford it, I had to have it. I built an 8,000 square foot house thinking I was going to have four children. How many of you have been there and done that? <laughs> now I'm in a 4,400 square foot house. I'm, I'm about to be 59. We don't have any kids. We have three dogs that are our children, but we have way too much house. These habitat homes, and I know the commission chair, chairman uh, Jones was there. They're 14 to 1600 square feet. The city made an exception for us to build those, but they are Earthcraft certified. They are quality homes that everybody who volunteered and comes to the dedication says, "Honey, this is all we need." And the reality is, this is all we need. But fortunately for me, people buy what they want, not what they necessarily need. <laughs> but lastly, and remember, I live here, and I'm not going anywhere. It's a cultural thing in this county. Working in other communities, Cobb, Fulton, City of Atlanta, with the exception of the City of Atlanta, it is hard to do business in Douglas County. And it's because we do have an authority, and one thing I can say about the WSA, they're consistent. They, they don't treat anybody, they treat everybody the same. They, they impose their rules and regulations. But being on the development authority and knowing various people for years, big companies look for a reason not to come to Douglas County. Builders and developers who we're currently looking for, who have the financial wherewithal to come into these communities, Holly Springs, other ones, they're looking at the economics. Why should I come to Douglas County? And when they're hearing things like, God, the WSA is running us through the mill. We have a new, you know, there's so much turnover. We have a new administration. There, nobody who used to be there is there anymore. It's difficult to do business. They eliminate Douglas County right off the checklist and they go elsewhere. Um, many of you probably remember when Atkinville and the Smyrna area started to boom. Well, there was a reason. The county commissioners, the city council 
took the position we are going to be pro-development and we're going to do everything in our powers to bring quality development into this community. And they focused on that and it got accomplished. I live here because I have a lot of ties. I'm not going anywhere. But in good conscience, if a friend of mine called me and says, I've got three kids and where do I need to move in Atlanta? Unfortunately, I could not recommend this community. I'd have to tell them to go elsewhere. And if you all are completely honest with yourself, you would probably tell them the same thing. So once we can solve that issue, that cultural issue, I think we can attack why, what can we do here. But until we do solve that, um, you know, we can sit here for hours and I'm not so sure we're ever going to get anywhere. I will challenge the mayor and both uh, Chairman Jones. You all have a seat on the WSA. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not so, so sure. I was asked a few years ago to be on that board, but I'm boarded out. I've been on too many mm -hmm. boards. Um, I would challenge you all to actually dig in to what is going on over there and not just think that at your meetings, your board meetings, you're getting all the information you should be getting. Uh, Daryl, you have anything to add? I'd rather stay neutral. Yeah. Well, and by the way, I still need to do business in this community. I love Douglas County. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Thank you for telling the truth. Thanks, Thank you. You yeah. know, it was around and seen that. The only thing is, is the Board of Education is even worse. Okay. Thank you. Th thank you for that, that input. And again, this is, we appreciate the free freedom of speech. Uh, we appreciate the input because it, it is necessary. And, uh, and I appreciate uh, Mr. Chu's comments about culture. Right. We, we get it. Right. I mean, so th there's some latency that says, okay, but that was then, this is now. Right, and it's a real, so that's the point of honesty is that no, there's perception or, and a discernment of, of what's, what's slowing it down. And it does sometimes take the political will to make the change. Right, and it has to be, you have to push back and say, no, we got to do this different. You can't get there from here. So when I'm in this meeting about Douglas United, and I look at all of our representatives up, at, uh, up on the dais, our economic development, our water sewer authority, industry, school board, you know, I, I, I'd like, okay. Great marketing, great image, great sale, but when you get inside the kitchen, it's like, okay, same old, now, that, that's, that, now we're getting delusional, so that means that we have to go deeper, right? There's no way around this and stuff, so else we're just spinning our wheels, we're just sitting here taking up time. So I appreciate the time that people are putting into this. Is there anybody else who wants to speak, because we've got to keep this going, I, I'm sensitive we've got this um, um, order of the business. This was just supposed to be our first conversation to open it up. Go ahead. If I could just add, I think yeah. what Chris and Leslie really kind of summed the whole thing up because we started out kind of on a topic of, you know, mm -hmm. kind of honing in on one issue. But as I mentioned, it's, it's broad, um, you know, to your point. And, and you're right, you know, we can have all the great marketing and everything, but if we don't tackle all the things within and be proactive about certain things. So sometimes we go right after a symptom, but we don't necessarily go to the core of the issue. If you can't get a home appraised for what you want to do, that's bigger than, you know, uh, a, a pipe, you know, that, that needs to be repaired. It, it's, it's, a, it's a broader issue. So what are those, <coughs> when we go back to that strategy, it's invest with intention and where, and where are we intentionally investing our dollars so that we can prop back up that marketplace to where we can get um, those investments. No, and I, again, I do appreciate the conversation about our appraisals. I do appreciate the conversation with banks. We did identify that earlier this year. Madam Chair talked about we need to bring the bankers to the table. The whole CRA, I mean, there, there's other influence we can do uh, where we do have the talent on this board to be able to have that conversation. So duly noted on the whole bankers not being here, but we're not letting them off the hook either. Uh, anybody else? Commissioner Garvey. Yes. <laughs> yes, you just. Uh, the school board needs to be on, on, at the table also. The school board. Also. Definitely. They, they need to be uh, at the table. Now, uh, when I first took office, I was invited to go up to Harvard University by Frank Alexander, a professor at Emory here, to, to a land bank conference. And we, I came back, uh, we presented it three times to the board, and it got shot down. 
um, land banks have really helped a lot of the blight property through the development authority. I, I think um, that would be your uh, avenue. But as far as the builders and everything, uh, we, we do need to look at um, smaller homes because of the aging uh, population. And we also need to, um, but still have the quality, the quality homes. And I have a subdivision in my district, Whitestone, that has come to a halt for since 2009 because the bridge was washed out. And we can't get it built back. <laughs> we, we work with everybody under the sun to try to get it built back. But this board needs to move on it. Now, I think we're talking about 200 lots out there. And uh, we, I have seen a lot of more um, PVC subdivisions being developed in my district. I, I know in Mirror Lake, a lot of uh, building is going on. We just had one down in uh, St. Andrews that we uh, worked out the, the logistics and everything on. Um, so uh, we're beginning to, I think the market will help a lot because uh, it's, it's strange that I've had a bank president tell me they have more money than they know what to do with, but they can't loan it out because of all the restrictions at federal le level. Uh, th there has to be criteria that is met and everything. Um, they went from one extreme to the other. They were giving people houses that could not afford houses. Now they won't give people houses that they can't afford. So um, there's a lot of aspects to it, but we certainly do need the banks at the table and the school board. <coughs> and we need to, uh, there are certain circumstances maybe that is uh, just for this one subdivision that needs to maybe be looked at and worked out with WSA or whoever. But um, my case is bridge. Who wants to buy a house when the subdivision is divided by a ravine, a ravine going through it uh, where the bridge was collapsed back in 2009? But we have a builder that wants to build it out, but he's not going to do it until the bridge is built back. So uh, there's a lot of people that we need to be looking at. So I yield back. All right. Is there anybody else who wants to speak to the board commission? We're going to close this out again, uh, not taking anybody off, off the task, but we just wanted to hear uh, if there's any industry people that, if anybody, staff, you guys have reports, anything you want to submit, please submit it to our clerk. So we'd love to take a look at whatever you to validate what you're saying to help us better understand. But James, anything yeah, else? Yeah, I'm good. We'll, um, I guess we'll schedule a follow up meeting with some of our the industry folks uh, as a next step, and then uh, we'll talk also and, and decide also. Madam Chair, your pleasure. Okay. Madam Chair, Gil Shiraz was invited. Um, he wasn't able to attend. Um, yeah, he's going to make that on record. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yeah. Sure, we hear you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you all so much for coming in and pre appreciate your uh, candidacy. And we will take a look at it. Certainly, we don't want the perception to be what you mentioned earlier, being the second worst. We want to be uh, the best. We want to, because we realize there's no room for second place. So we are not just taking your conversation lightly. We will continue to move the ball forward. I realize that you said it's been years that nothing has been done. So I commend this board for just listening today. So we will uh, report back. Thank you. We have, uh, we'll move to tab number 21, Board Appointment uh, to the Behavior, Health, and Developmental uh, Disabilities Board to be discussed in our executive session. Uh, County Attorney, do we have, do we need to go into executive session? She's offering uh, uh, legal, real estate, and personnel. Okay, Board of Commissioners, do I have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, please. Uh, Ooh, no. Just 10 minutes. <laughs> Any other comments? No. With that being said, this meeting is adjourned. Yeah.